UFC 296, the final episode with Fight Night Picks, as we always say, let's get into it. You know, a month or two, I, I didn't think I, I was ever going to be able to fight again. And oh my, they're here to bang, boys! <laughs> Gerber is one of those unique fighters too. It really depends on what the buildup is to see what version of him we get in that fight. I wouldn't be surprised if either of them take it. That's just how, how I feel with it. It's time for the Fight Night Picks Podcast. Let's get into it. And just like that, we are back here at Fight Night Picks. As always, one half of your host, you know, Craig Allen X and Instagram at Craig Allen FNP. With me to my left, to your right, respective socials, Matt Allen FNP. And I decided to do a little tally throughout the years, Matt. We have each predicted so, so many fights. Going into last weekend, uh, the record for me, it was 1,257 wins. 694 losses, 26 either no contests or draws. You were at 1,239 wins, 699 losses, 26 draws. As Craig tries to erase the last two years. No, no, but uh, way back in 2020, Matt had predicted less fights than me, and that's the reason why we're at where we're at right now. But Matt, we'll say it. I mean, we're, we're not going to pick five different fights. You're Probably up by not. five so far. The split decisions, they were chintzy last weekend, but regardless, it's been a wild year here in 2023, and we we really do want to thank everybody out there for the continued support. But after UFC 296, probably go and Derek with the channel. You call it an indefinite hiatus because, listen, it's like tying a sneaker. You never want to call it forever. You're going to loosen up the laces at one point or another. But don't expect any videos to start off 2024. Don't expect them midway through 2024. Guns N' Roses took an indefinite hiatus. They came back after years and years and years. Were they called like Velvet Revolver though, or was that a different thing? That well, that was a different thing. With okay. Slash and my Bye. guy Scott Weiland, who the fans they know I like STP, but Matt. Regardless, we got a big fight card coming up this weekend. 14 total, two title fights up at the top. Pantoja is going to be taking on Roy Vall. You also have Edwards in his second title defense. This time he's going to be taking on a returning, hopefully resurgent Colby Covington. The last time we saw Covington, main event, UFC 272 in a fight of the night. Against Jorge Masvidal, that felt like one of those consolation prize fight of the night. Just what a deep card do we have this weekend, right? That's the first thing that stands out to me because it just has a great mix of every kind of fight that you want to look for, right? What have been just the mainstay fights that we always like on this channel? It's when a prospect that you have a few question marks about is kind of making that step up to really face one of the more known and proven contenders in the division. We have a few of those fights this weekend. I know Tony Ferguson, Patty Pimblett is a fight that's going to get a ton of headlines going into the weekend. Uh, Vicente Luque, Ian Machado, Gary's another one but do you know what fight i'm excited for that a lot of people probably are in the year 2023 almost 2024 brian kelleher cody garbrandt is going to be a fun fight and is that going to be a fight to dictate who's going to win the title probably not but is it going to be as fun for as long as it lasts i think it's going to be well and it's going to be one of those ones brian kelleher coming off that cervical spinal fusion surgery he hasn't fought in a very long time for cody garbrandt he was supposed to fight against mario bautista former common opponent but it didn't happen so that one fell out not that long ago the former champ versus the Dana Whites looking for a fight vet. It is an interesting one. When you look top to bottom through this card, 18 ranked fighters. We usually slag on the UFC when fight night cards have one or two. There's 18 on this card. There's only one rookie debut coming at you. The kingdom of Bahrain's own, Shamil Gaziv. He's going to be taking a very difficult fight against Martin Budai. So overall, a big time fight card. Again, 14 total fights. If anything falls out, if anything goes awry, you can find us here on the channel for this week only. It's a special, but you can find us here. We will update you as best as possible. Last weekend, obviously, Sumit Ergy's opponent, Elan Nascimento. That one fell out. He took on Tim Elliott. We were here on the channel covering it. But again... Overall, a very, very deep card, one that you can look forward to. Toss a like on your way out the door. We got a lot to talk about. You're going to want to keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it. With the winner hoping to break through the ranks and maybe steal Michael Chiesa's number 14 in the welterweight division, we have Rude Boy. Can he get it up? I don't know, but it's Randy Brown. He's going to be taking on the king of kung fu, Muslim Salakab. When you look at this fight from the outset, again, these two guys, they're clawing on the door of the rankings. And if you look at it for Chiesa, the reason why I bring up his name, he's on a losing streak. He just turned 36 last week. It does feel like a win for either one of these guys. You're in, and a loss is pretty 
pretty well welterweight purgatory. Have fun fighting the Warley Alveses of the world or a Dana White's Contender Series winner. But when it does come down to this matchup, the road to the UFC for both of these guys could not be more different. For Randy Brown, Ring of Combat 53. He's going out there and getting a win. But why is that important? It's because... On that card, a young Chepe Mariscal as well as Brian Kelleher. So it was Randy Brown and Kelleher getting that shot. Ring of Combat 53. It was a Dana White's looking for a fight episode. They both get the wins. They both get into the UFC. And for Randy Brown, 11-5 and five since he debuted in 2016. He's had high highs. He's had low lows. And if you look at the losses, they really are against some more of the marquee names. We saw that for Randy Brown, his second to last fight. He goes down to Australia. He fights their guy, Jack Delamont. Madalena, but his last time out, a really resurgent win. So for Randy Brown, again, he really had to claw his way up through in the Northeast scene. He's a guy out of Queens. He really does train a cross train in the New Jersey, the New York area. You look at it from Muslim Salika. Again, we all remember his spinning hook kick or heel kick that he had against Melvin Gillard to book his shot into the UFC. And Melvin Gillard got put on a poster by Salikov and Israel Adesanya, earning both of those guys their shot at the UFC. But Muslim Salikov, you may not know, the nickname is King of Kung Fu. His martial art is Sanda. That's Chinese kickboxing, brother. And he made it. As far as anybody's ever going to make it in the sport of Sanda, he won uh, somewhat of an ancillary tournament outside of the 2008 Beijing Olympics. He gets gold there. He is a multiple-time world champion, five times over in the discipline. And when you look at this matchup, Matt, I, I get a lot of notes on it, but you can really boil it down easily. Muslim Salikov has slowed down in his last five fights, and he's really relied a lot more on his wrestling and his counter-striking, whereas Randy Brown... He gets hit in those half beats, but when they're not in the half beats, his boxing does very good work. Randy Brown has always reminded me a little bit of Brendan Allen, and the rise that we have seen Allen make at this stage of his career, let me explain why. Because earlier on in Randy Brown's career, he was known a lot more for the grappling side of things, right? We saw the offensive takedowns a lot more. He wasn't as offensive with the submissions as he is now, and that's a testament to how much Randy Brown's whole game has grown at this stage of his career. But that is the weird thing. I agree with you 100% what you said at the start of the video, how the loser of this is going to kind of go down to that welterweight purgatory right you don't really know what they're gonna get it'd be a darn shame if that happens to brown because he still is a fairly skilled fighter i would say at this stage of his career and i would say this about both fighters it's not like they're losing to nobodies right like they both have had very respected runs in the ufc up until this point and that's why i do expect a fairly competitive fight between these two because for all the things brown does well the fact that he can threaten with his own wrestling he's a good defensive grappler we've seen the long range strikes although yes he has been able to get caught at distance just really power heavy guys were able to get on the inside have always been able to disrupt Brown, but I do think the totality of his game and the fact that he's going to at least lead with striking is going to allow Salikov to at least time some counter shots. Now, is he going to be able to keep those going for 15 solid minutes, defending takedowns, potentially shooting his own? I'm not sure about that, but I do think at least in the early goings of this matchup, it should be pretty competitive and we should get some bigger exchanges between the two. Well, and that's it. You look at it for Muslim Salikov, the 5-1 in, it is 3-2. We focus on the losses, one to Li Jingliang, and it was a little over a year ago. You remember that big yeah time jab to the body left up top and then there's an overhand right behind it it's a knockdown it's a ground and pound it's a tko he loses that matchup he then goes on to take on former wonder boy i mean man it just the the flames they burnt too hot for andrea fialio and that was the second of four straight knockout losses for fialio was his fight against muslim salikov salikov is last time out he's going out he's taking on nicholas dalby and Nicholas Dalby was this Wim Hof <laughs> breathing. He's able to overcome and withstand and beat Muslim Salikov. So again, the pace has is, pace is kind of waned on Salikov in certain ones of these fights. Even think back to the first fight that Salikov had in the UFC. He looks great against Gallard. He fights Cuban-Canadian Alex Garcia. He loses in a little bit of the wrestling. We think of some of the best wins for both of these guys in the UFC. And they have won bonuses. They both have. If you look at it for Salikov, Fialyu is a performance bonus. Nordin Taleb's another one for Randy Brown. I mean, uh, you've got that win over Alvesh as a fight in the night. But when I look at this fight, Matt, I mean, I'd say the best win that Randy Brown's had. That one arm submission he had over Alex Oliveira, that really was a special one for Muslim Salikov. Maybe poor Ricky Rainey. I mean, that's got to be bad vibes, especially when he sees Stephen Wonderboy Thompson out there. That was his guy. But when I do look at this one, I mean, 
like you look at the the timing of a guy like Muslim Salakad, it's still there. Even at 39, the timing hasn't left him. The speed is still there in some of those counters, but he has gotten himself caught. Both of these guys have seemingly added more wrestling to their games as it's gone on. You can kind of stat that one numerically, but for me, I do like the timing of a guy like Randy Brown, though he tends to lead with his chin in a lot of these exchanges. Well, that's the thing. Even the Cowboy Oliveira fight, it's easy to look at the submission and remember that. He was getting leg kicked early. He was getting touched up. And that's always been the thing about Brown. He does need a little bit of time to really settle into the fight. Once he does get his jab going, the front kicks are really good too. I like those. We're going to talk about front kicks a lot on this card with Wonderboy Thompson and Tony Ferguson both being up near the top. But for Randy Brown, I do like that kicking game out of him. And I do like the fact that he's a big guy for the welterweight division. And I don't mean that in terms of muscles, right? He's not built like a Brock Lesnar, but he's tall and rangy, so when he can use that long range, it does help complement the wrestling as well, so I agree with you. I like the totality of Brown's And game. before we touch on the topology votes and so on, when you look at Randy Brown, his last time out, he's taking on Wellington Terman, a guy who's sealing... I, who knows where it's at, but the floor, it's very low. And in that fight, Randy Brown defends the takedowns, beats him up on the feet, and really mixes it up. So that was a really good performance from Brown his last time out. His knockdown ratio, though, in the UFC, 4-4 four, four to 4 against. We look at this matchup, Matt. Randy Brown, a pretty darn big favorite. We have a look over on Topology. Surprise to us there to you. Matt, I mean, I got one foot out the door, so to say, with eight pages of notes. I'm a Muslim Salikov fan. I've always enjoyed his fights. So I, I hate to see these fan votes, but I'm going to say over under 80% Randy Brown. I think they're going to be under, but he will be the favorite. And they are, oh my goodness, 1,080 total votes, 79% Brown, 77% by decision. For the 21% that have Salikov, 51% by decision, 24% by knockout. So normally we're a little bit more impartial on this, but I do have Randy Brown in the matchup. Again, comes down to the timing, the boxing, but with Muslim Salikov, he can go to the legs, he can go to the head, he can mix in some of those spins, so he will make it interesting. It's not an easy test for Randy Brown. I agree with you, though. I do like Brown for the fact that he can just use so much of his own skill set. And if he is able to confuse Salikov and not really let him get his timing, then I do think Brown's going to be able to go out there and get the win. I'll watch out for the kicking range, though, from both these guys, because if Brown uses his offensive kicks, it's great. If he just stands out there at kicking range and doesn't use his kicks, he's going to leave an open target for not only the legs, but the body as well. So I think there's areas for Salikov to win this fight, but I do think Brown's just the more complete fighter. Both of us going with rude boy Randy Brown to get the win. Two title fights up at the top. Pantoja Royval, that's a rematch, but a fresh matchup in the welterweights. You got Edwards taking on Covington. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. It's riddle time at Fight Night Picks, and we're going to go with this. Name someone who's four wins and newfound ranking but none of it matters, Matt. Uh, we're going to be naming Martin Budai. This is a guy, he's had four fights in the UFC, all of them wins. He's recently earned a number 15 ranking, and all of a sudden it means absolutely nothing because he gets to welcome Dana White's Contender Series veteran from this past season. It is, of course, Kingdom of Bahrain's own Shamil Gazib. And when you look at a fight like this, Matt, for Martin Budai, he comes in, he's the Octagon Heavyweight Champ. He fights on Contender Series a few years ago. He gets a short notice call against Lorenzo. Hood and they have a back and forth first round. Martin Budai finishes them, and the fans they really like this guy. They love the tape they saw on the regional scene, and then they get the fight against Chris Barnett, where illegal strikes in the third round ultimately end up as a technical decision. Budai gets the win in that matchup. Now we all know what happened in his next fight. He wins a split decision against Ukash Drevsky. Somehow. Nobody at home thought that uh, Budai won that fight. He got his legs kicked out from under him. He got boxed up. But still, that plotting forward from Budai was somehow able to win it. His next time out, he gets another win. He beats Jake Collier in a little bit of a stinker. But again, Budai, using that body weight, pressuring forward. He's kind of like a, a, an old Josh Barnett in the sense where he's going to grind on you. He's going to make it grimy. But when you look at a guy like Budai, he can really get a lot of that work done well in tight. But Budai finally gets that statement win his last time out against Josh Parisian. First round submission win, gets that number 15, and nothing really matters. And for this one, training at Ground System Gym over in his native Slovakia, he's got a big time name over there in Stefan Wojciak to train with, a guy that's competing with KSW. And you look at it for Budai, you look at it for Shamil Gazeev, and I, I found this really interesting because for Gazeev, I mean, I am AF, African, European, and Asian champion. He was able to get all of those accolades together. You all look travel. at it for Gazeev, and he's a little bit similar 
similar to a Muhammad Makaya because if you're fighting for Brave or you're fighting in around Bahrain, you're probably representing the kingdom and you're probably training at KHK, which he does. But if you look at it for Gazeep, years and years ago, he was over in Russia and he was training with some of the best and brightest. There's pictures of him out there with Ankalaev, with Durakimov, with Matt's favorite plodding forward light heavyweight from Russia of all time. You know what I'm talking about. Get Shimarat Antigulov, as well as Shamil Gamzatov. And I do think that Shamil Gaziev is very similar to Shamil Gamzatov. Undefeated, really great record, not that great of a fighter, and we'll see how well the UFC career plays out. Because there's two versions of Shamil Gaziev. There's the guy that goes for that early takedown. There's the guy that has that great ground and pound, really good upper body strength and pressure. Gaziev, once he gets those takedowns, kind of like Cody Durden at Flyweight that's on this card. I'm keeping it down, brother. But when you look at a guy like Gaziev, he's got really great pop in his shots. You saw that on his Contender Series fight. He gets the knockdown. Awkward scramble, gets his back taken. Yeah. It was a really interesting fight. But once Shamil Gaziev gets kind of loses, like, he loses a little bit of his confidence in the striking, or we get past the first half of the first round, he walks around like Wreck It Ralph, and it gets really scary because those knuckles are dragging on the ground. It is an odd fight, right? Like, Budai's a ranked fighter, but light heavyweight's unlike most other divisions. Where heavyweight, just, heavyweight. Heavyweight, sorry. Light heavyweight and middleweight, I should say. I'll open it up to all three of those. You don't really need a lot to get ranked in those divisions. Unlike, you know, bantamweight or featherweight, where you're going to beat about 700 fighters to get ranked. But this is an interesting matchup, because Budai, I think, at least in this matchup, does a lot of things the judges do like. And you kind of alluded to that earlier on in the video. Just his plotting forward style of, hey, you really got to hit me with a big shot for me to take a step back, does at least fare well in the eye of some of those judges and I do think that's going to be important because if Shamil is just comfortable moving backwards trying to set up one of those massive punches that he will and if he just shoots reactionary takedowns and isn't the one moving forward and trying to get Budai up against the cage then it might be difficult for Shamil to just do enough positives in the eyes of the judges outside of some of those bigger actions but the one thing about him that I did focus on a lot his ground and pound is really heavy like you had mentioned he does a good job of it's the can opener move where you like bend their head up when you're sitting in their guard he does a good job of getting by the full guard and he will be heavy too just kind of forcing a lot of pressure on his opponent's neck it just looks like a really uncomfortable spot underneath again there's not a lot of fighters in heavyweight where you think oh under them would be great but he does do a very effective job with some of those positions and it is a fighter to where let's say Budai is going out there using some clinch control having a hard time getting takedowns maybe getting one here and there but just not doing a lot of uh, explosive uh, actions maybe Shamil could just you know do enough at the end of some of these rounds to get the judges on his side because this is a weird heavyweight fight to where you don't look at at it like some other ones right to where it could just be a knockout in that first round and then the worst fight ever afterwards i do think these guys are going to at least kind of match each other but like you had mentioned and again i think it's a good point shamil's cardio on the regional scene was a little bit concerning now luckily he was able to win a lot of these fights early and that has to be said you can only fight the guys you're fighting but the level of competition is a little bit questionable so you go back through and you look at a guy in shamil gazeev he's undefeated it's hard to be incredibly negative when all of your Stop. wins are by finish but you go back you watch his fight on contender series he fights greg Velasco's fellow undefeated fighter. Shamil was a minus 575 favorite, so you don't necessarily love to see that. As I said, his first right hand, it lands, he drops Velasco, he gets on top, he's able to kind of really squirm himself in a good position, and then Velasco scrambles out of it, he gets the back, Shamil ends up getting the rear naked choke in amongst some of those scrambles, so it was a really good win for him there. His fight before that against UFC vet Darko Sozic, a guy who had a title fight with KSW not long after he was outside of the UFC. In that fight against Sozic, Matt, in terms of the weights, it was 118.65 kilos for for Gazeev, it was 108.9 kilos for Stuzic. So that's 161.59 pounds roughly for Shamil Gazeev to 240 for Darko Stuzic. And you look at the finish, and it's a knockout win for Gazeev at 2 minutes and 50 seconds. Darko Stuzic looked like a world beater at the start of that fight. He dropped with a giant, giant shot early. Uh, he was able to drop Gazeev. Every single left hook was able to land for him. He drops him. There's a little bit of wrestling exchanges. It really is Rock'em Sock'em Robots. If you watch any Gazeev fight, 
I'd say watch the Darko Stuzic fight or watch his rematch that he had against Grigory Ponomarev. And that one, he fought Grigory as an amateur. He's got a couple of rematches on his ledger. Two against one man as he was an amateur, one amateur and then pro against Grigory. That was a wild fight. At the start of it, Grigory wins the first round. In the second round, man, Schmil's able to come back. Hands down by his sides, landing odd angle punches. He drops his opponent. He gets a win. I think the fight that a lot of people are going to reference, I mean, you can even go back to the Pavel Delidko win that he gets in the second round. He looks amazing in that one, but the fight that he had against Kirill Kornilov is one that people are going to be a little odd about. It's a split decision win for Shamil Gazeev. So other than that, they are all by finish. They get 10 wins by finish, one by decision as a pro. That fight against Kornilov, it's odd. It's a split decision, and Shamil looks tired by halfway through the first round. But I actually thought that he won, if not all three rounds, two of the three rounds. I thought he was able to do enough with his takedowns. But even in the first round, he struggled with some of the striking from distance. So, again, my big takeaway from this, Gazeev, he can throw well enough in combination. You know how good the power is. He is a really good prospect, and he is undefeated. But it kind of feels like not that long ago when the UFC brought on Bogdan Guskov to fight Volkan Uzdemir. Here's this unranked guy fighting out of Russia. He's really good. He's got all these knockout wins. Let's give him a ranked opponent. And Volkan and does goes the dynamite. Now, Shamil with the takedowns, it is very good. I think Budai's got good takedown defense. Budai's got good jiu-jitsu. And Budai is probably the steadier fighter over three rounds. You saw that in the Collier fight as an example. Lose the first, wins the second, wins the third. But again, when you're dealing with a guy that's so good at wrestling and a guy that has such pop on his shots, it does make you a little bit concerned. It was a lot of fun tape study, too, for Gazeev for this one. I am excited to just see him against some heavyweights, but we talked about purgatory and welterweight, right? It's never been worse than at the heavyweight division. You have your top 15, and then you have everybody else who could all beat each other on any given day. So it is really important to try to get some of these wins so that you're not stuck just fighting Parker Porter and Purgatory forever. But it will be interesting because the thing about Gazeev that I do like is his ability to throw in combination. But there was a point that Luke Thomas brought up years ago when Edson Barbosa knocked out Benil Dariush, and I think about it a lot. And it's Edson Barbosa is so good at striking that he can tell which one of your shots is going to be the power shot and what's just trying to set up that power shot. Sometimes Shamil will just have a tendency to throw some empty volume, if you will, to set up that power shot. And if he is fighting an opponent who has that next level fight IQ of, hey, I kind of realize you're not trying to hurt me with some of these initial shots, trying to set up that one big one, I think that he might run into some bigger counters. Not saying Budai is going to be the opponent to make him do that, but just something to watch out for in the future. Yeah, Kornilov, Ponomarev, Stozic, Delitko, like, all of these guys are hitting Shamil with that exactly. big left hand. And Shamil's right hand to block it it's down low to start a fight, and it comes down lower as they go. But again, I can't stress, like, how good the takedowns are. he's got a are. great left hook himself, too. The thing is, though, and I do agree, the right hand comes down when he throws it offensively. So what if we see, like, a Carlos Condit, Dan Hardy situation? Because that would be great. I think, well, it's Matt Mitrion Fedor just for this fight at heavyweight. But we look at him, Matt. Budai is a slight favorite. We have a look at the topology vote. Surprised us there to you. They usually do favor the UFC wins. I'm going to say over under 70% Budai. I'll say over. Two massive guys for the division. Oh my though, gosh, it's the opposite. 1,025 total votes, 70% Gazeev, 64% by knockout for the 30% that have Budai, 61% by decision. The fans going with Gazeev, the odds they have Budai. Matt, we are at a crossroads here. So I, I kind of tipped my hand earlier. The reason I said the judges favor a lot of things Budai does well is I don't know if we're going to get a finish in this fight. Like stylistically, they do mirror each other quite well to where I don't think one fighter is just going to have one massive advantage right? Like, uh, Tim Elliott had a pretty big advantage grappling with Sue G. I think that's fair to say. And that was one of those fights where it's gonna be one-way traffic, one way or the other. I think this will be a pretty closely contested fight, although I do agree with you and how Shamil might not be a ranked fighter, even though if he wins this, he will be. But I do like Budai in the overall matchup. I think we're gonna get a fight that goes late in the heavyweight division, and I just think the advancing uh, actions of him, and we're probably gonna get a lot of clinch work out of these guys, too. Well, and for Gazeev, if you look at it, his fight that he had against Kornilov, there was a 29-27 in there, a 10-8 first round i've seen him lose first rounds against kornilov i saw him lose a first round against ponomarayev that's a tough name for me with martin budai go back to his fight against Kamil minda for the belt over with Invic or invicta octagon yikes he's fighting invicta we got problems he loses the first round he comes back in the second round he flicks the jab out there like alexander emilianenko against eddie bankson minda goes down and it's a win for budai so we have seen these two guys 
overcome. Again, that Panamaraya fight, Gazeev is bleeding like a stuck pig and he's still able to win it. It's like a Josh Emmett fight. So, Matt, I do have Martin Budai in this matchup. I think this is going to be a fun fight at heavyweight. Hopefully gave you the pros and the cons out of both of these guys. But, Matt, when we do look at this card overall, the two title fights up at the top, a lot to look forward to. You're going to want to keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, as we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it. Big time banger at Featherweight coming up this weekend. It's like the Keith Richards riff and start me up. Poor Lucas Almeida, 1-1 in the UFC. Four bouts that have fizzled out, but finally gets an opportunity to take on a big time name. A guy who's been in the UFC a time or two. It's Andre Feely, a guy who's fought Yair Rodriguez, Max Holloway. The big names, maybe he hasn't beaten them and that's why he's fighting Lucas Almeida. But when it does come down to this one, Matt... Feely looking to get back on track. You look at it, the five on in, one and three. He's got that no contest, that really bad eye poke against Daniel Pineda. And for Lucas Almeida's last time out, really trying to turn the page, so to speak. He was taking on Pat Sabatini, and he had no answers for the takedowns and the grappling. And the funniest part about this fight is for Lucas Almeida, he's a jungle fights champ. He comes in on contender series and has a wild fight against Daniel Zellhuber. Doesn't get the win, but the boss pretty well had him on speed dial. Dana White was very complimentary, even in a loss. Now, last weekend, Shannon Ross got knocked out on Contender Series, got blood poisoning, and they awarded him a four-fight contract. But if you look at it for Lucas Almeida, he really did make do on that debut after he went back on the regional scene, beats a guy in jungle fights that was much undersized, and then he goes out there against Ultimate Fighter winner Mike Trezano, the lone wolf. There's multiple knockdowns in that fight. Almeida lose the first round, rallies back. He ends up getting the finish in the third. So for Almeida, it's all fire. It's all fury. All 14 of his wins are by finish. And for Andre Feely, again, he's been in the UFC for so darn long. And this is a guy that took that MMA turn around 19. He started developing a training right out of the jump at Uriah Faber's Fitness, now Team Alpha Male. And for Feely, again, you know that he can blend in a little bit of the wrestling. He can switch his stances a little bit from Silpa, might throw a kick here, from Orthodox, might throw a kick there. Usually they're both head kicks. And Feely can mix in a flick of the jab. I mean, from sun up to sundown. So when you look at a fight like this, it's a lot more of the power shots from Almeida to a lot more of the technique from Andre Feely. We'll see who's got a, a bit of a volume advantage in this one. We'll see who's got a speed advantage in this one too. But Matt, when I went back and I watched the tape on these two guys, from 19-year-old Andre Feely to the guy that we see here now at 33, and Lucas Almeida on the regional scene in 2016 to Lucas Almeida in the UFC right now, Almeida's the same fighter, and Andre Feely's added little things to his game. Well, he has. He's been at the UFC for a lot longer. This is the thing about Feely, though, that I worry about in this matchup. When he moves forward and throws his kicks and does throw in combination, he is a very difficult fighter to deal with because of the X factor of his wrestling. You always have to worry about his ability to shoot underneath. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you Touchy Feely is the greatest grappler of all time once it does hit the mat. He can get stuck in kind of awkward positions here and there. But it's a part of his game that you do have to respect and you don't initially think of it because he is kind of a tall, rangy fighter. But this is where I have such an issue with the matchup. At least when I think of his skill set, I think Andre Feely has a great chance to win this fight. But he doesn't always fight in that aggressive manner. He will give up distance a lot in his matchups and it reminded me a lot of when Yoel Romero fought Robert Whitaker. This could be some callbacks this episode of previous fights but Yoel Romero is a great fighter right? Stylistically he's a bad matchup for a guy like Robert Whitaker but what does Yoel do every fight? He will give away moments right? He will just stay on the defensive try not to get hit by big shots and those are times when his opponent can take advantage. For Feely he won't have such a big difference between his offensive and defensive skill sets but sometimes he will just be happy throwing that jab out from distance. He'll get low with the stance sometimes if his opponent is a wrestler too, and I do think that that eliminates a lot of his own offense. Now, is that going to be as big of an issue against a guy like Almeida who's going to go in there with a higher stance himself, throw in combination uh, quite a bit? Maybe not, but that's always been a part of Feely's game that I think he could work on. He is such a well-rounded fighter, but if he's fighting someone who is a good wrestler, he won't necessarily let those hands and legs go as much as we would see otherwise, and that has kind of held him back because Feely, you can't really critique the skill set, right? He doesn't have poor cardio, the output's not terrible, like he doesn't have the craziest pop in his shots, but Artem Lopez I made a pretty big head kick one time and went down. So again, for Feely, the pieces are all there. It's just, can he put them together and go out and really consistently beat guys in that top 15? Because I think on his best day, he could definitely have good fights with them. And you look at it for Feely, some of those fights where the takedowns, they were accentuated. His fight against Charles Jordan, that weird split decision win that he had where they were both like, what? That's a split. The fight that he had against Felipe Arantes and the aforementioned greatest of all time, 
Artem Lobov. We know Artem Lobov or Lobov MMA is out there watching. But when you look at it for Feely, 2-4 and four with an O contest since his last bonus. That was earned against Shaman Marais where he said, Happy trails, have fun with PFL. And when you look at it for Feely, again, he's been on that big spotlight. He's fought the big fighters. He's had two co-main event slots where he was uh, not victorious. He's had three uh, co-main event slots total one uh, course against Dennis Bermudez but when you do look at it for Feely again we'll see how the activity plays out we'll see how the stance switches work out and for Feely again his last time out against Nathaniel Wood you got that big overhand right Wood hits him with it stuns him he lands another right cross it drops Andre Feely then in the second round Feely with the check left hook as Wood leads with his head he wobbles him a little bit and then he goes tie knees and that ends up dropping him again we see a little bit of the jiu-jitsu a little bit of the grappling in that matchup but the reason why I say for Almeida that things haven't really tended to progress I was bullish on him coming into the UFC and contender series on his takedown defense and if you go back and you watch his fights I mean yes Pat Sabatini is going to be one of those better grapplers at 145 but you go back and watch his fight against Kakushio over there with Jungle Fights who was not a very good fighter the takedowns came very easy and then I went back and watched his fight against Diego Barboza in 2016 the takedowns were very very bad so again that's the worst part of Lucas Almeida's game. We know that the chin, it's there. It's its an upsy downsy type of chin. But he has been knocked down, but he has gotten back up again. All of those finished wins. Almeida is the underdog in this matchup. Andre Feely's almost a 2-1 to favorite. We have a look at the topology votes, Matt. See what the fans are thinking. I'm going to say over-under. I think it's going to be a little closer. Over under 60% Feely. I think it's going to be over. It's going to be over? Oh, it's way over. 981 total votes, 80% Feely, 81% by decision. For the 20% that I've Almeida, 46% by decision, 40% by knockout. So the fans that I've Almeida, there's a large preponderance who think maybe he gets his first decision win. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be a blue moon this weekend, but who do you have in this one? I do have Andre Feely in this matchup, but I can't throw up enough red flags because at 33 years old, he's not really a 33-year-old, and you bring it up. He has fought the majority of he, his MMA career in oh, front of our eyes. So Andre Feely went to Team Alpha Male at 19, joined the UFC at 23. His win to get him into the UFC was on West Coast FC card that featured Max Griffin in the main event. It featured a 9-1 and amateur Anthony Hernandez and a 6-0 and amateur Benito Lopez. Imagine being at that card in California. That's just the whole thing about Feely. I, it's what I mentioned about Anthony Smith last week. It just has the damage taken its toll too far. And for Feely, he's not getting put out, right? It's not like he has that many stoppage losses to a guy like Smith, but he doesn't accept damage all that well. And the fight that I always go back to, remember the Calvin Cater fight when Andre Feely should have run over him? Like, Calvin Cater made his UFC debut. No one knew who... He, now, here's the thing. Calvin Cater's really good, as we all know now. But it was really one of those fights like, hey, we'll keep Andre Feely busy and it'll kind of get him back in the limelight after that win. He really struggled with the boxing of Cater when he wasn't able to use his own kicks and if Almeida is able to get on the inside and if he doesn't respect those long range weapons of Feely he could have similar success but I do think Feely with the wrestling is going to be able to at least mix it up enough to get the win and Matt there's only been three Lucases in the UFC that's wild Lucas Alexander who just recently lost by finish to Jekka Saragi you also have Lucas Martins went four and three left the UFC on a win they didn't renew his contract I don't know who the toughest Lucas is in the UFC we'll find out if it's Lucas Almeida. I'll go with Andre Feely because I think that wrestling advantage can play out. But just like the Anthony Smith comp, he wasn't able to get it done against Roundtree with the wrestling last week. And we'll see if Feely's able to incorporate it into this matchup. And Almeida's got decent jiu-jitsu, but he more so gets things set up with his hands. So I'd really like to hear from the fans on this one who you guys have in the comments section. Both of us with my wife's least favorite nickname in the history of MMA. Touchy Feely. Andre Feely to get the win. Some big time fights in this card, Matt. The next one, Tegir Ulanbekov's taking on Cody Dearden. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Flyweight never dying. Coming up this weekend, uh, like Cody Durden's performance dictate, he carried his lunch pail to earn the number 15 ranking just last week with Devison Figueredo moving up to the Bantamweight division. Cody Durden gets that number and he gets to fight against another number. It's a former Fight Nights Global AMC flyweight champ, Tegir Ulanbekov. And Matt, to whom much is given, much is tested. Tegir Ulanbekov, the one loss, it is to Tim Elliott inside of the UFC. Listen, if you're not dying, you're not trying, you're not cheating, you're not winning, Ulan Bekov struggled in that third round against Tim Elliott. But what I do know out of Ulan Bekov, very highly skilled, a win outside of the UFC against Asu Almabayev. That was a really interesting one to go back and rewatch today. 
because Ulan Bekov is on top. Now, he had a little bit of a record. His opponent did not, but uh, our guy, Asu Amabayev, now in the UFC, just got a performance bonus a couple of months ago against Ode Osborne. If you watch the way that fight goes, it ends with little tiny rabbit punches from this far away that look like they're not hitting, and it's like a shake weight punch, but Tagir gets a TKO win. So when you do consider it for Ulan Bekov, he ends up losing his belt, his only other loss, to Zhalga Shumagulov. And I thought, why not go back and rewatch that fight getting ready for this a one? A popular guy. Ulan Bekov, presumably, probably not a lot of children. Zhalga Shumagulov, he's got seed running Do you know everywhere. how hard it would be for him to cancel plans? Like, we make that joke, right? No one's ever canceled plans. Zhalgas has multiple. He's like Kevin, uh, who, I think I need two phones. Kevin Gates. He's like Kevin Gates with the amount of phones that Zhalgas well, has. For Tegir Ulan Bekov in that fight against Shumagulov, I mean, at one point he drops him. I had... Round one, round two, round three for Ulan Bekov. He drops him in the third with a one-two cross. And when you do look at it for Ulan Bekov, that really is the key. It's a lot of jab. It's a lot of jab. It's a lot of jab. One-two. And then he mixes it up with a little bit of his grappling. You saw that his last time out performance bonus against one Nate Main. It's that disgusting, disgusting standing guillotine win that he had. But for Ulan Bekov, again, he can get hit. He can get stunned. And he is partial, just like a Shamil Gazib on this card, to dropping that right hand and getting hit by lefts. And we saw that against Shumagulov a little bit. You saw that against Tim Elliott, where Elliott goes with the jab. Now, only difference there is Silpot Orthodox. But the big overhand left lands for Tim Elliott. It drops to Ulan Bekov. But other than that, they've been very clean performances. You saw him wrestle a little bit in the debut against Bruno Silva. You see him wrestle in the majority of his wins. But again, when it comes down to this matchup, Matt, for Cody Durden, I say it. This guy brings a lunch pail in. He's tougher than a $2 steak. We've seen him wrestle himself into exhaustion. You think of his last loss? Because he's won four fights in a row. His last loss was against Mohamed Makayev, where Makayev throws a jump knee, drops Durden. Durden gets back up, gets himself into a guillotine, gets submitted, and it's over very quickly. But other than that, in the UFC, the draw, that wasn't a win, but he still gets it done. I mean, that was on short notice, a 10-8 first round against Chris Gutierrez, who probably shouldn't talk to the fans in the apex during his fights. And then the other loss that he has out there, I mean, and it has been quite some time, but Cody Durden, he just tires himself out a little bit. He gets too emotional. He gets arm tri or flying triangle choke by Jimmy Flick in the first round. So we'll see how it plays out because Durden is on a massive heater right now. And Frulon Bekov with this really long layoff after the Manus win, we'll have to see if he's able to add any more tools because by and large, Ulan Bekov is another one of those guys. Pretty well the same fighter he was when he started. Pretty skilled fighter though with that. Yep. Like, Ulan Bekov does have a lot of skills at his disposal. I agree with you. There are some things that you can nitpick, but for the most part, like... There's nothing he can't really do. Like, he might not be a 10 out of 10 at it, but his skill set is very complete. And I think that's going to be really important for this matchup. And another unpopular thing I'm going to say is defense for both guys is going to be the most important thing in this fight. And you don't often say that, right? Because MMA is such an offensive oriented sport. You don't really get rewarded for defense like you do in things like boxing. But for Ulan Bekov, if he can use some of that footwork and dig under hooks to just really make Durden's life uncomfortable from outside, Durden has decent power. We've seen some glimpses of it in the past. JP Bays, I'm sorry, he had to find out about it. But I don't know if Durden is a complete enough fighter from that range to just keep on cutting off the cage and go out there to win a 15-minute fight. And and that's why I think his cage cutting versus the overall defense of Ulan Bekov is going to be so important. And it's, I know those aren't things that you always look to and you want to get excited for. But if Ulan Bekov can just use those feet and dig underhooks, I do think defensively he can do a good enough job to make this a really low output, low volume fight to where the differences between every round are going to be pretty close, right? It's like winning on the margins as a small market baseball team. But both guys, I like the heater Durden's been on because he has changed my mind about him just in terms of, you're right, he will wrestle himself into exhaustion. But I think... I think that bar has slowly raised itself and for where he will get exhausted and that's the biggest thing that helps his skill set move forward he's one of those fighters that's invested in himself i mean att atlanta he is from atl and if you look at it for him he's moved down to american top team proper in florida he's gotten that good training he's invested in his cardio and we saw it i think his best performance in the ufc you could argue maybe the charles johnson fight I'm going to go with the Carlos Mota fight where Mota, he's a flyweight champ from the LFA. He's a really, really interesting fighter. And Durden's able to go out there 12 minutes and 32 seconds of control time. Put it on him. Mota obviously had some issues with the old USADA after that fight. But that was a statement win for Durden. But you said one thing that's really funny and it kind of caught me off guard because we don't watch fights together and we don't write notes together. I have it here. Knee, knockdown, guillotine, sub, Makayev right after that. Durden follows on the feet. 
Cody Durden follows a lot when it is on the feet, and Tier Lombeka cuts it off when he is trying to walk guys down. That is a big thing that I noticed from watching the tape on both these guys. We talked about it in the Gazeev fight where he's going to be taking on Martin Budai. Just a comparable with Cody Durden when he gets guys down. You might see a high takedown number, a high takedown ratio because he has that high motor and you might think, wow, he's probably not very heavy on top and he's not able to get things done. Kind of flip the switch. He does pressure down quite a bit with his hips and once he gets his upper body up around the shoulder area, neck area, head area of his opponents, he can really wear down on them quite a bit. So when you do look at this fight, I mean, both guys, they will wrestle, they will grapple, but in different ways. Frulon Bekov, maybe more of the singles. He likes to get the body lock to trip. He is an interesting guy that way so if you look at it Ulan Bekov the slight favorite in this matchup we have a look at the topology vote surprise to us there to you I'm gonna say over under 70% Ulan Bekov I think it's gonna be over and it's under so 1109 total votes 66% Ulan Bekov 67% by decision 24% by submission for the 34% that I've Durden 85% by decision and I think you know for Durden there's not a giant fight that jumps off the page or out of the tape study that's comparable to a fight for Ulan Becca, but Ulan Becca fought Bruno Silva, who's a little bit of a buzzsaw, shorter guy, good wrestling, and he was able to win out in that one in a close fight. So I do like Ulan Bekov in this one. I like the steadiness, but sometimes he can find himself backed up. And sometimes, too, where that right hand isn't high enough, he can freeze. There's times where he does a little like a little stutter step, like he's Alexander Ovechkin looking to get going on a break. But Ulan Bekov will do the stutter step back, and there's no pullback. There's no recoil. There's no shot on the counter. He just leaves his head out there. So it does make you worry against a guy who throws a lot of power shots in Cody Durden. For sure, but I've also got Ulan Bekov for what I said earlier. I think his footwork is is quite a bit better and I also think he's gonna be able to defend with submissions also just defending the takedowns as well and that's the thing if he can make Durden just so uncomfortable for shooting those takedowns in the first place you are going to eliminate a lot of what makes Durden so special and like we've mentioned he does have a pretty high motor so I don't just think one uncomfortable guillotine is going to completely ruin Cody Durden's uh, game plan but I do think it's going to be enough to just help Ulan back up get some of that separation land some shots in the outside 28 takedowns for Durden and it's just such a short amount of UFC fights he's had eight of them and for Tagir Ulan Bekov one thing to watch out for he's had six withdrawals out of fights since he joined the UFC in 2020 so knock on every single piece of wood that you can and hope that this fight actually happens this week Matt both of us going with Tagir Ulan Bekov to get the win a couple of title fights up at the top one in this division in the co-main event Pantoja taking on Roy Vall you're not going to want to miss it keep it locked in with Fighting Apex we always say let's, let's get, get into it, it. On the heels of last weekend's UFC Vegas 83 co-main event where you had a short notice Anthony Smith teammate of one Dustin Jacoby coming in on short notice defending his number 8 ranked against number 11 ranked Khalil Roundtree Jr. We have a fight in the lower half of this ranking system at late heavyweight Alonzo Menafield taking on Dustin Jacoby and it's a really fun fight because if you look at it for Dustin Jacoby he's that old wily vet. I mean he came into the UFC over a decade ago gets out wrestled by Clifford Starks gets finished by Chris Chris Camozzi, and then he goes on this world tour, picks up a new sport in the meantime. And for Jacoby, what do I mean about that? He had some meaningful fights over with Bellator. He fought David Branch, eventual two division champ at World Series of Fighting, number one. But the biggest hallmark for Dustin Jacoby. He fought Alex Pereira in kickboxing, and they had a wild fight until it wasn't wild anymore, and Pereira shut his lights out. And then Jacoby went on to fight some other big names as well. He was able to finish, or, or at least get a win, rather, against Carl Robertson. He fought Canadian standout Simon Marcus, not once, but twice. Didn't win those fights, but for Jacoby, I mean, the kickboxing acumen that he had, it really did just sharpen those knives that he has, and he's been able to go out there. He went on a massive win streak from 2017 to now, and this includes his last three fights. He's one and two. He had a two-fight losing streak, but from 2017 to now, Dustin Jacoby in MMA, boxing, and kickboxing is 12-2-1. So he's done a lot of winning. And even out of those losses, those, those two losses that he has very recently, one against Khalil Roundtree Jr. that a lot of people thought that Dustin Jacoby had won, to the other fight that he had just after that against Azamat Mirzakhanov, where 
He really didn't look good, and every single time he got hit, he had an adverse reaction. You did like to see that he was able to rally in the third round, but for Jacoby, his last time out, he gets a massive win over Kennedy and Zechiku, hits him with a big right hand, drops him, finishes it up with a ground and pound. So a good win for Jacoby. I call him a wily old vet. He's about five months younger than Alonzo Menafield. That's kind of wild. And for Menafield, it's been a good run in the UFC. Seven, three, and one so far. He gets a win on Contender Series, the inaugural season 2017. He then has to beat Deshaun Boatwright in season two in 2018. But it's been a mixed bag. But these last three, four fights for Alonzo Menafield, I mean, three wins, one draw. And if he didn't grab the cage in one of the later rounds against... Uh, Jimmy Crute, it wouldn't have been a draw, and, and Menafield would have won on the judges' scorecards. He goes out there his last time out. Guillotine's Crute is going for a takedown, which is wild, but Menafield's really hit a stride in these last number of fights. He definitely has, and both these fighters are at very strange, just crossroads in their careers, because you can kind of liken it a little bit to Randy Brown at the start of the card, right? Against the king of kung fu. Alonzo Menafield and Jacoby have had a lot of bites at the apple, if you will. They have had a lot of recognizable names on their resumes, but in different ways, I would say. We've always said D Dustin Jacoby was kind of that 16th ranked fighter, right? If you beat him, you're probably getting ranked, or at least fighting a ranked fighter afterwards. Whereas Menafield, I feel like, had that push early on, gave people some reasons to maybe not believe, but he definitely has regathered himself and become much of that fighter that we thought he once was. And the thing about Menafield that you have to like is, you saw it in the last matchup too, you can get carried away with the big power when he's able to land with it he's got great submissions that just sort of come out of nowhere if he's able to get that right spot and he's absurdly physically strong for this division but the other weird thing that i want to mention is outside of some of the finishes for jacoby it is frustrating right he can just fight to close fights by his style in the wins or the losses and that's something you always have to look out for because i'd say he has really good power not absurd power he has good volume but not great uh, volume so if you do have exceptional in either one of those areas and if you can clinch him up against the cage you can fight your way back into a lot of these matchups against jacoby you're gonna get hd in the corner of alonzo menafield you had him out there the last time matt everybody's favorite pat barry but matt when you look at it for menafield's knockdown ratio show in the UFC it's four to two so it's been pretty good you look at some of these losses again there have been three in the UFC you think of his biggest win it's probably that Paul Craig win where Paul Craig's going for a spinning shot and Alonzo knocks him out but out of those losses William Knight where he kind of got controlled he struggled finding his range he just didn't have the volume that we're accustomed to seeing same thing in his fight against Ovince St. Pru he really couldn't track him down he ends up getting finished in that fight and then against Devin Clark yeah he landed some damage against Devin Clark and we always think of Devin the jaw is probably broken the teeth are probably bloody and it was a pretty close fight but Clark was able to just control large portions of that fight so for Menafield you like where he's at right now his fight against Misha Serkinov when I went back and watched that one today it hurt me man like poor Misha the Canadian you hate to see it but Menafield is able to go out there and you can tell every single powerful shot it made Serkinov second guess it and he just kept wanting to be outside of the range so for Dustin Jacoby again you're going to want to see him try and dictate range he's a guy he's got really good leg kicks he can I throw them from say. all sorts of different angles but all sorts of different distances and in a lot of these Jacoby fights where that kickboxing acumen comes into play is he can typically dictate the distance of a fight he didn't in the first round against Iwan Kutsalaba that was a 10-8. And he didn't really do it against Maxim Grishin, who's no longer in the UFC. Probably because he's like 38. But when you go back and you watch that fight, Jacoby's still able to do some nice things in tight. A close one. But he's not able to get that flow to him like we're accustomed to seeing on the outside. So again, range, it's going to be a big thing in this one. But I do, like, Alonzo menafield has got that power that makes a lot of opponents second-guess things. It just matters which version we get. That's the thing. Like, Metafield is a weird fighter. Because when you think about it, like, he hasn't lost in four straight fights. It's a pretty good run to be on. He was already thought of quite highly in the division. But the losses have just given people so many reasons to not really believe that he can achieve that top 15 and really stamp himself in there for a long time. So that is the weird thing about this matchup. Like, I was surprised to see where the odds are just because of how powerful of a fighter Metafield is. And let's say Jacoby is happy to shell up, throw some light kicks, and it does take him a little bit of time to settle into this fight. I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever if Metafield's able to get on the inside, land some big power shots and get this fight over with whatsoever, just because Jacoby can struggle with that range sometimes if he's not able to land those light kicks. But those light kicks are phenomenal, and I agree 100% with what you said. The range is the important thing, too. He can throw them almost chest to chest to his opponent. That's a very unique skill set to have. Jacoby's about a two and a half to one favorite in this matchup. We have a look at the topology votes, Matt. Surprise to us there to you. 
I think it's going to be a close fight in general. But yeah, when the odds are like that, I'm going to say over under 67.5% Jacoby. I was thinking it was going to be above 62%, so I'm not giving myself a lot of wiggle room. I'll say over. You're going to say over? Oh my gosh! It's over 62. I said 67.5%. 1,094 total votes, 68% Jacoby. By half a percentage point, you get a rate. 45% by decision, 46% by knockout. For the 32% that I have Menafield, 29% by decision, 57% by knockout. So decision or knockout, who gets the win? So you brought up some of the knockdown numbers, and I'm glad you did. I didn't have them off memory, but Menafield has been hurt by shots, and that's the one thing I do worry about. His defense is a weaker part of his game, and if he is worried about maybe not even just defending takedowns, but just worried about all three levels and defending all three of those levels, I think Jacoby might be able to sneak one of those power shots in there and hurt him. And the last performance by Jacoby really kind of got the bad taste that uh, was left in my mouth after those two previous losses. So I do like Jacoby, but I can't throw up enough red flags in, turn of, in terms of he's a big favorite. And I just don't really get why, because he can have those slow starts. And Metafield's given us more reason than not to believe he can knock pretty much anybody out. Well, I mean, Dustin Jacoby's a little bit like Paul Newman in the 80s in Color of Money. Which is, this isn't the hustler, Paul Newman. I mean, he's still got a few tricks up his sleeve, and we'll see if he's able to teach the youngins over there at Factory X what he's got. But when I do look at this one, I like the overall volume for Dustin Jacoby. I mean, if you look at it, 5.46 to 4.02 strikes landed per minute to absorb. If you look at it for Alonzo Manifield, over a decent sample size, 3.82 less 3.09. So you're not seeing Manifield getting hit all that much, but he's not throwing the same amount of volume. He's trying to pick his shots. He's trying to pick the power shots. But again, both these guys up there, plus Jacoby's fought in two different combat sports, and I've seen him get knocked out in the other ones as well. So when it comes down to this one, Matt, both of us are in agreement. We're going with the Hanyak, Dustin Jacoby, to get the win. Some big time fights in this card. 170 pounds in the marquee. The belt's on the line. Edwards looking to defend against Covington. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight and Apex. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Flyweights on different trajectories battle it out in the UFC's octagon. Coming up this weekend, we have King Casey O'Neill looking to get her first win in 672 days. She's going to be battling the queen of violence, former KSW champ Ariane Lipsky. And Matt Lipsky had those big time moments outside of the UFC. She was on the poster years ago with KSW, gets a win over not just Diana Belbizia, but after that, Silvana Gomez Juarez. And that's somebody in Lipsky that started off her pro career year at two and three so she's really been able to do a lot of special things but inside of the ufc a mixed bag five and five for lipsky she wasn't able to live up to the hype at the start multiple losses in a row she comes in they give her joanne wood she's not able to beat her then she fights molly mccann loses that one too looks like all hope is lost she beats Isabella de Padua, you know, the one and done fighter. It was a must win. It was, it really was. And she's able to go out there and get some of these performances done. But her last two, a win over JJ Aldrich, who looked like she was stuck in mud. And then Lipsky's last time out, she gets another win. For O'Neill, though, I mean, you saw her set a UFC women's flyweight record with 229 significant strikes against Roxanne Mataferi only a few weeks after that to then tear ACL go on the sidelines, have to get surgery, take a long time back. And her last time out, she goes out there and takes on Jennifer Maya. And the volume numbers were still pretty good, but you're trying to play Maya's game against a former title challenger in Maya. Now, one thing of note, Matt, for Casey O'Neill, she set that record. It was then broken at UFC 283 by Jessica Andrade by two strikes, 231 to 229. So wild volume from both of those women. But the big takeaway, Matt, from Casey O'Neill and her last two performances, in a win, in a loss. This is an excellent grappler who's gotten better at boxing. And that's kind of wild because for O'Neill, you look at everybody that she trains with at Extreme Couture, it is a lot of women who can grapple. You think of them and you go down through it. Taylor Guardado is the one that comes to mind. Tatiana Suarez, Misha Tate. But you look at O'Neill over on her Instagram, and maybe it's just a play, but she's continuing to accentuate her striking. You always see from Orthodox, lead leg, head kick, one, two, every single time, and pretty well all of the videos. But that has been the big thing for Casey O'Neill. And the biggest part, I think, about this fight, Matt, you put your tinfoil MMA math hat on, Ariane Lipsky looked awful against Antonina Shevchenko, got finished in the ground and pound. 
Casey O'Neill, the flip side, looked great against Antonina Shevchenko with the ground of pound. So for O'Neill, I would think she's going to get away from what she's done in her last two fights. We'll see how that works out for the game planning. And for Ariane Lipsky, the same part about game planning. What I find interesting for her, she goes from American Top Team to Lioness Studio. And then for this one, she's training back down in Brazil, Ras Thai with her husband, Mr. Santos, Hanato, or sorry, Hanato Silva, not Santos. If we got problems like that, then they're big problems. But uh, yeah, interesting stuff switching camps. And the most interesting thing about Ariane Lipsky, you go over to her Instagram, most emotional pool scene I've seen in a long time since Squints faked it with Wendy Peppercorn and got that kiss out of her. Because if you look at it for Lipsky, her, her husband, Vicente Luque, and Gregory Rodriguez baptizing them in a pool in somebody's backyard in Florida, I've never seen so many tears shed in a pool. Uh, that's a lot to absorb, I'm not gonna lie. Imagine just going for a run and seeing that being a UFC fan. You're like, I'm... 98% sure I recognize the majority of those people. This is a weird fight for this reason. You Holy are right. Glory. Casey O'Neill is really good at her grappling. We all kind of know her for that, how aggressive she is when she's able to get the fight to the mat. But I do agree with you. The striking has been catching up to the level of the grappling, but I just don't know if it's at the level still to go out there and get a ton of wins over people without using that wrestling. Because maybe she could beat people on the outside of the top 15, just getting into the top 15 with some of that striking. But for her to ever really make a bunch of leeway in this division and make those waves that people thought she was going to and beat people like Jennifer Maya, she's going to have to improve, maybe not just the offensive part of her game but just improve what else she's going to do because I think Casey O'Neill in that grappling it's a little bit like Sean Brady right we said that about Brady before he fought Cal uh, Calvin Gaslam it was hey if he gets the fight to that one spot you're kind of screwed no matter who you are but if he's not able to get it down he could struggle and I do think O'Neill could still struggle on the feet even though she has made those improvements the difference is is Lipsky going to be able to threaten off her back enough to get the respect out of somebody like Casey O'Neill because I I know Lipsky has the ability to throw up some of those submissions. I don't know if her skill set off her back is just going to be good enough to deal with the aggressiveness of someone like O'Neal because the more you give O'Neal in terms of distance and separation trying to create those scrambles, well, normally it just puts her into more advantageous positions. If you look at it for Lipsky, the five on in, she's three and two. You consider her last six fights and four of those, she was the underdog. So she has been slept on even in these last two wins that she's been able to string together for the Queen of Violence. She was the underdog. And if you think about it, in terms of submissions for Lipsky, I mean, underwhelming, it was kind of like, I don't know, the dame of violence, because she wasn't the princess, let alone the queen, but you think of that submission win in 2020 against Luana Carolina, that was a contender for submission of the year, unfortunately, at the World MMA Awards, they amalgamated 2019 and 2020, and Damian Maya's submission over Ben Askren won But when I think of Ariane Lipsky, at, like, before she came to the UFC, being the queen of violence, it was a lot of clinch work, elbows, high volume, her ground and pound was really good, too, back then, it's just... I would like to see that uptick in aggression because if she can make Casey O'Neill uncomfortable on the feet, yes, moving forward might help her a little bit shooting her own takedowns, but if you can defend those takedowns and have confidence in your own takedown defense, and if Lipsky can force the fight to O'Neill, she might be able to go out there and really make her uncomfortable and have success on the feet. Casey O'Neill was due a fight back in September against Viviani Araujo. She was out of that fight. It was reported by MMA Fighting, I'll throw the picture up there, that she had broken her nose in training. So we'll see how that plays out. Maybe that was a first First time we'll see how the breathing goes but Matt for Casey O'Neill she's favored in this matchup and if you look over on topology surprise to us there to you with these votes I'm gonna say over under 75% O'Neill I think they're gonna be higher and oh my friggin goodness a thousand and eighty six total votes seventy six percent O'Neill seventy eight percent by decision for the twenty four percent that have Lipsky eighty percent by decision and Matt for O'Neill I think it's gonna be the bread's gotta get buttered I lost my first time out and I didn't have her to beat Jennifer Maya, but in this one, I have her to beat Ariane Lipsky. I agree with you. I think she's going to go back to the wrestling shoe, show off that part of her game quite a bit more. And if Lipsky does have a big weakness in her game, it's what she's able to throw up off her back against those really elite grapplers. And I would say Casey O'Neill is an elite grappler when she decides to use it. So I have O'Neill. Interesting fighter, though, because she's always been one of those prospects. The best version of her does look to be one of the uber prospects. But there are some holes in her game that are concerning. If she ever was to fight a, a Jessica Andrade, perhaps, or just some of those classic 
names you think of at the top of the division. Both of us going with the woman representing Scotland and Australia representing Eternal. Her father, Cam, owns that promotion, Matt. We're going with King Casey O'Neill to get the win. Let us know what you have down below in the comment section. Some big time fights on this card. Listen, Shavkat Rachmanov is going to be taking on Wonder Boy Thompson. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's get, get into it. it. This is a big time comeback fight at Bantamweight. We have the former champion, the fan favorite, no love, Cody Garbrandt. He's going to be welcoming, boom, Brian Kelleher back into the fold because for Brian Kelleher, his last action in the summer of 2022. And if you missed any of the drama that unfolded earlier on this past summer, Brian Keller was supposed to take a fight against Journey Newsom back in April, rather. And we did a video for it. But then in the pre-fight medicals getting ready for fight week, it was found out that Brian Kelleher had a little bit of a neck injury and he took to Twitter to let the folks know what was up. It was the last fight on his deal. He was in a bad way that way with the injury. And then he's talking about getting C5, C7 cervical fusion surgery. You go over, you check the Instagram, you check the Twitter again. And Brian Kelleher is out there the day of and posting in May of May 25th rather he's posting that he just got the surgery so he's got the neck brace on and everything then not that long after June 10th there he is in his garage doing strength band training with the neck collar still on Kelleher he's recouped he's recovered and now he's getting ready for this matchup and Kelleher is such an interesting fighter and I'd like to start off there more so than with the champ the fall from grace you guys know the story with Cody Garbrandt for Brian Kelleher like, he already had fought in Bellator, he fought with Ring of Combat, he fought with really big promotions, he had won belts, he had done this, he had done that, he fought Julio Arce a couple times, beaten him. But Brian Keller came into the UFC on the same Ring of Combat card as Randy Brown. They were both Dana White's looking for a fight, guys. And if you go back and watch that episode, Keller not only gets the finish, he jumps on the cage, then he jumps into the crowd and he's telling Dana White, you gotta sign me, bring me in. So it was kind of crazy to see that to the guy that then gets a performance bonus in his first UFC fight against Alcantara. He's gone 8-7 and seven since. He's lost the big names. He's lost his last two fights, Mario Bautista being his last time out. But if you look at it for Kelleher, you know what you're going to get. He's good when he mounts his offensive takedowns. His takedown defense isn't all that great, but he's good at scrambling. So. He's a little bit like the Georgie Karahanian of the UFC with his guillotines. And when he mixes in his boxing, it is quite good. Now, you think of his biggest win, it's probably over... You guessed it, Matt. The Hennem GOAT. Hennem Burrow. It probably is that win. Only for Brian Keller's next fight to go. You saw the first knockdown. But John Lineker, right hook to the body. Left hook over top. Put Brian Keller on a poster. So Kelleher's, Kelleher rather, has had a topsy-turvy run so far in the UFC. But overall, it's been memorable. And in this fight where he has so much activity and does so much well. If you only look at Cody Garbrandt's last fight that I'll talk about. Keller could arguably get a win in this fight. I'd hear the argument. I love watching Brian Kelleher fight, and I'm not ashamed to admit it whatsoever. Like, Journey Newsom versus Brian Kelleher is one of those fights where Craig and I giggle about it, that like, oh, this is going to be, oddly enough, the best fight of the night. And it probably would have been, because Kelleher is one of those fighters where he's going to give you everything he has, for better or for worse. Is he going to walk into some big shots? Is he going to shoot ill-advised takedowns into subs? Like, yes, he might not be perfect in those ways, but it's not going to be for a lack of trying. And there aren't a ton of MMA fighters you can say that about. Like, there's some fighters who just straight up don't have that dog in them. And Brian Gallagher definitely has that dog in him. And fighting someone like Cody Garbrandt, who it comes down to, can you break and not just bend Cody Garbrandt? Especially with some of the striking defense really throughout his whole entire career. And durability rarely is something that gets better over time. Although, hey, Andre Arlovsky proved us wrong. Brian Kelleher, like you said, though, has all of the skill sets necessary to beat Cody Garbrandt. Because what does Kelleher do well? He has pretty good power in both hands. He throws big looping hooks. He might overcommit on his strikes, but again, they are powerful strikes at that. He has good defensive takedown or defensive uh, wrestling and good uh, defensive submissions. Those two things play well into fighting someone like Garbrandt. The things I worry about, though, are A, the injuries, like you had mentioned, but is he going to be able to deal with the speed of Cody? Because Cody reminds me a little bit now of like late career Vitor Belfort, right? Like Vitor at the end of his career was getting knocked out a lot. His defense wasn't good, but he still had the hand speed. He still had the thing that 
that made him special in the first place. And if Garbrecht could go out there, use the jab, and at least use his feet to shuffle away and evade some of the returning shots of Kelleher, I think we could see maybe a vintage Garbrandt performance is a little bit too much to ask because that was dusting everybody in the first round. Like, Cody Garbrandt was a bad dude at one point. But I do think his overall boxing skill set and the speed in his hands is still enough to go out there and get a total package uh, fight and get a 15-minute performance out of him. Yeah, because Cody Garbrandt against Mr. Always Smiling Thomas Almeida. I mean, that was a win. Mm. And if you look at it for Garbrandt, he was undefeated. He was able to go 10-0 and and make it so at UFC 207. He took on the actual Bantamweight coat. I do love Hennem Morrell, but he took on Dominic Cruz. He gets the win there. And then it's Dillashaw, Killashaw, Dalla, Dalla, Billashaw, and gets that knockdown. But, of course, what we've learned over the two Dillashaw fights, the fight that he had against Pedro Munoz, it's those right hands that are able to land, and Garbrandt tends to drop. So, if you look at it for Garbrandt, he struggled in those matchups. He's had a big fall since. You think that one win against the Sun Sal, which in a vacuum aged really well, that's one of the most disgusting knockouts ever. And then Garbrandt, oddly enough, he gets a main event against Rob Font. He can't figure out the distance. Font jabs his head in. He works the wrestling a little bit which is going to be my story for this fight. Then he moves down to 125, gets knocked out by Car Car France. And his last time out, he took on Trevin Jones. I bet you 95% of the people that are watching or listening to this video or audio podcast didn't go back and watch the Trevin Jones fight. I did, and guess what? It fucking sucks. It wasn't good. Garbrandt looks good in the first round. Garbrandt, he's able to land some strikes. Matt, Garbrandt goes 17 of 19 on significant strikes. Round two, Garbrandt goes five of six on significant strikes, wrestles a little bit, wins the first round, wins the third round. Or sorry, the second round. First round, second round. Round number three, Garbrandt goes four of eight on strikes and loses the third round to Trevin Jones, who lost his fourth straight fight, and then it was happy trails for Jones. Garbrandt looked really bad his last time out, even though it's a win. These are the two things that I was going to say, too. Even the Ascent Sal win, which the knockout in a vacuum looks great, his hands are down before he lands the shot. Cody Garbrandt has always had that issue. And the Jones fight, I like it a little bit. Remember when Greg Hardy fought Volkov and it was the weirdest fight ever? And like, it was a terrible fight. Never go back and rewatch it. But it was one fighter who was just quite a bit better than the other one and decided, hey, I'm just not going to take any risks tonight because it's not worth it. That's a little bit what Garbrandt Jones felt to me. I might be giving him a little bit too much leniency on that, but he just didn't take any risks in that matchup. And that's not the Cody Garbrandt that got to the championship. And that's been the thing about Garbrandt, right? He was a hungry fighter getting to the title, but does he still have that? edge to him because if he does move forward let's say he does have that newfound aggression like he used to have with his hand speed and his power if he still has any remnants of the hand speed power he once had he should be able to cut the distance and land on Brian Kelleher at pretty consistently you would think. And Kelleher struggled against good wrestlers Batista, Umar Nurmagomedov, Ricky Simone, Cody Stamen and you kind of mentioned it that off advice takedown attempt into a submission against Montel Jackson but for Kelleher guys that can really work in the takedowns they've been able to cause him problems Cody Garbrandt high school all-american in the wrestling some issues getting into some schools some big ones he's supposed to go to michigan state didn't happen he was supposed to go to college didn't really happen but if you look at it for garbrandt wrestling was a hallmark on the way up through they made it a story they kind of wove it in a little bit to his title run but if you look at it for garbrandt this is the biggest thing with the wrestling and the striking he goes to team alpha male he gets the belt he starts to lose he leaves team alpha male and then all of a sudden he finds himself at extreme tour training with not just the man the big champ the big dog eric nixick he's training with my guy who hates right sleeves dewey cooper as a striking coach but the big thing if you look at it right now matt for garbrandt ufc pi extreme tour dewey cooper all encompassing if you look at the guys that he's brought in for this camp and garbrandt was supposed to fight mario bautista not that long ago it fell out there was an injury to garbrandt during fight week this Sue Garbrandt is training with right now, Matt. It's a picture reveal. It's not going to be done in post, and you're going to love this one. This is who he's training with. Training with Alex Perez well. and Lance uh, Palmer. Lance Palmer's on the right-hand side, Matt. It's a little small in front of us. Lance Palmer looks about 50 pounds bigger than he did, and he looks like he's doing what his dad does. That guy's on the gear. Matt, Lance Palmer on a poster that Anthony Pettis signed. They said, hey, throw that squiggle down there. Where is it? Where is it? It's very hard to see. He's the only one that signed it was Anthony Pettis. But Lance Palmer on that one for the Bubba Jenkins. But the wrestling is all about it for Perez and for Lance Palmer. I think Cody Garbrandt goes out there and wrestles in this fight. 
I do, but I'm also worried it puts himself in bad positions. Because Cody Garbrandt, at his best, wasn't going out there shooting singles and double legs. And it's what I've said about every fighter who ever adds that secondary ability. Not that it is for Garbrandt, because like you said, it's that was kind of the thing that got him into MMA. But Garbrandt, at his best, is throwing his boxing combinations, using his footwork to be evasive from his opponents. And even in the losses uh, throughout after he had the title, like there were positives to take away. He did hurt Dillashaw on multiple occasions throughout that fight. I know the knockout losses have been bad, but I just don't know if Keller her has the hand speed to catch up to somebody like Garbrandt. I agree with you. Maybe we will see a lot more wrestling out of Garbrandt, and that would be nice, right? Have that another tool in your back pocket when the striking isn't going well. It's just, if Garbrandt wasn't doing that on the way up, it's hard for me to see him just go, hey, I'm a wrestler now. I liken it a bit to, like, Chuck Liddell, right? Like, Chuck Liddell wrestled and that was his whole bread and butter. And then he was like, hey, I'm only going to use it defensively now. Gaethje a little bit to the same degree. I worry that Garbrandt might have fallen into that. Well, we did see Garbrandt do it against Font, so it no, is No, he did, there. but he also got teed off on and thoroughly outclassed throughout the majority of that fight. And that's what I mean. His takedowns aren't so neat and tidy that it gets his head completely out of danger. And if it does leave him open for even a minor glancing shot from a guy like Kelleher, I think Kelleher has enough power to put down Garbrandt. He might not be the biggest knockout artist in the world. We'll though. see how that cervical fusion of five-year age gap plays out for Brian Kelleher. He is the underdog in the matchup. We look over on Topology for the fan vote. Matt, I'm going to say over under 80 percent no love garbrand i think it's gonna be over and it is over 1166 total votes 88 percent garbrand 39 percent by decision 52 percent by knockout for the 12 percent that have kelleher 23 percent by decision 64 percent by knockout matt i think a returning man off cervical fusion uh surgery beats cody garbrand in this fight i think brian kelleher gets it done in this matchup i hope he looks like randy orton at survivor series coming off back surgery because again i just like watching brian kelleher compete he has a very fun style i thought or either way he has a very fun style to watch like kelleher is kind of like tim means to me right he's that veteran who's going to offer you probably a harder fight than you thought but But, if you are a really high level fighter you're going to be able to get over that and that's why i have kelleher in this fight even if you look at it for garbrandt hand down he's going out there against the sun Sal, who was working the strike in that fight you look at garbrand his last time out what do we always say against trevin jones he's waiting 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 he makes fights boring defensive grappling he'll catch you on the counters but brian keller is going to bring it to garbrand we've seen garbrand struggle in some of those firefights so i do like keller in this one liking him a little bit to a munos with some of the boxing but he doesn't have as much of the leg kick so for me i like keller here I like Garbrandt in the matchup. I just think the overall speed is going to be a big issue for Kelleher. I think Kelleher is very dangerous in pretty much every aspect of MMA. And that's why you really got to watch this matchup for as long as it lasts. Because if there's 10 seconds left on the clock, Kelleher can get a win, be it with submission or with a knockout. So I'm excited for the fight. But I do have Garbrandt. I think we are going to see a little bit of that footwork and some of the hand speed. Going with Kelleher, who's on a two-fight losing streak. This is the last fight on his deal. Not going with no love. Cody Garbrandt to get the win. Let us know if you were in the large majority that have Garbrandt or if you're going with that slim underdog that is Brian Boone Kelleher. A big time fight in this Bantamweight division. You know, we love it. We get some big fights left on this card. Keep it tuned in. Keep it locked in. As we always say, Matt, let's Let's get get into it. Fresh off of one of the most lopsided title fights in recent memory, Mexico's Irene Aldana looking to get back in the win column, taking on Brazil's Carol Hosa Matt. When we look at this matchup, both women very good in the striking sure. in different ways. For Carol Hosa, she'll march you down with a little bit of a tie stance. She likes to mix in the leg kick quite a bit. But she will strike and clinch almost to her detriment. We saw that against Norma Dumont. Drops her in the third round. She could have finished it. And then she runs right in for the underhooks. And Host has kind of gotten close. But hasn't been able to get it done. In the UFC so far, starts off on a four-fight win streak. And since then, two and two. And in the losses, I mean, they have been here. They have been there. The first one is against Sarah McMahon. She gets out-wrestled. She then goes out and retires Betch Cohea. That's one of the comparables. Where were you when, Craig? On my couch. I remember it clearly, and that's not a joke. Hosa then goes out. She loses that matchup against Norma Dumont. Hosa's last time out wins a split decision against Yana Santos. And that's the other fighter that these two women have in common. For Irene Aldana, bloodies up Santos and finishes her on the ground. And against Betch Cohea, it was what it was. But Matt, for Aldana, she was one of those fighters too. Doesn't need to take this fight against Ketlin Vieira. Takes the fight and oh boy. So if you look at it for Aldana, she gets that win over Vieira. She's then supposed to get the title shot. She fights Holly Holm instead. Broken foot. For Aldana, she loses the decision. She wins two in a row. One against Yana Santos. One against Macy Chasson where 
wins the first round, loses the second round in the wrestling, starting to lose the third round, and then Shasan goes to stack and get back up, and it's one of the weirdest heel hits liver. Shasan goes down. Joe Rogan doesn't know what's going on, but referee Jason Herzog does, and he's like, yep, professional. It's, it is a liver kick. It's over. So a wild win there for Aldana. She gets a bonus out of that one, but we've seen Aldana struggle in the wrestling, namely that Shasan fight, namely that Nunes fighter last time out. 50-44 is a 50-43 out there against Nunes, capping off a great career for Nunes. And sending those Vancouver fans home mild. So, Matt, when it does come down to this matchup, if we get 15 minutes of striking, this could be really, really fun. And I'm more so inclined to think that that's how this one's going to go, too. I think it is safe to assume at least both fighters' primary game plan will be to go out there and strike. Now, if things start to go poorly for either one, maybe we will see some of the clinching and the wrestling. I do think the clinching will be important because for Rini Aldana, she's a really confusing fighter because, A, she's extremely skilled, but she always leaves you wanting more. Like, even in these wins by knockout, she's backing up in a lot of them, kind of forcing her opponent to be the aggressor, which I do think is going to be important in this matchup as well because Aldana moving forward she can do all right right like she's much more boxing heavy moving forward I would say she throws a good jab she does have awkward pop on her shots you don't look at her as being the heaviest handed fighter of all time but if she's able to land those hooks pretty clean especially with the advancing party of her opponent they tend to go down more often than not but the thing about Aldana is in the home fight she gets out clinched for a large majority against the cage and against Amanda Nunes that just wasn't a great fight for her let's just call it what it was but she can get out muscled in some of those positions and that's the thing that does kind of always leave you wanting more because you know what the skill set is but if she gets held down if she gets held back it just eliminates so many of the positives that we know from a fighter like Aldana and I'm glad that you brought up the light kicks of Hosa initially because those light kicks are going to be so important Aldana moves very well and can throw a high volume with that movement and if you allow Aldana to just make those half circles keep on throwing the jab the right hand behind it it's gonna be a really long night for Hosa but if she uses that light kick to slow down Aldana I'm not going to say it makes her game plan 100% effective but those strikes are going to become much more easy to land as this fight continues if i told you a 35 year old off one of the most lopsided title fights in ufc history that had a ufc record of seven and five and an actual ufc fight of the night against lucia Pudzalova was favored to win a fight would you believe me i mean if you look at it friday and Aldana, finish, you'd have to think right she loses in bc and then she attracts bc fighters to the gym and lobo gym mma you see diego lopez alessandro costa but also now lupe godinez of course alexa grasso but jamie lynn horth made the pilgrimage down with lupe godinez gets a win here recently so for aldana a champ camp there for kettle hosa prvt the list goes on and on there of course led by jessica Andrage, but you also see D Gomes there, a life partner as well as a gym partner. So Matt, when it does come down to this matchup, again, it's going to come down to volume. It's going to come down to the boxing of Aldana versus the overall skill set of somebody like Carol Hosa. We've seen Hosa make weird fight IQ choices for somebody that's got 20 two pro fights you think of her fight against Melissa Gatto, takes it down to the ground, gets submitted. You think of her fight against Dumont, drops her. Follows her into a clinch with underhooks. Like, she does make some weird decisions. Even in her fight against Yana Santos her last time out, it was a little bit of an odd one. Again, uh, split decision, round two, round three here, there. Ron McCarthy, Chris Lee, they were what they were. But Matt, in this one, Aldana, more than a two-to-one favorite. We have a look at the topology votes. I'm going to say over under 72.5% Aldana. I'll say over. Over and it is over. 1131 total votes, 89% Aldana, 77% by decision for the 11% that have Hosa, 79% by decision. Matt, the fans have Aldana, the odds suggest Aldana. Do you have her to win? I do, and I think by decision is a decent... Like, I agree with how the odds are split, put it that way, for Aldana, because I think some people might get carried away in the recent power surge of her, but if you go back and watch those performances, it does come down to a lot of those opponents walking into her power to help accentuate her own very good striking, but I think her footwork on the back foot is going to be good enough to deal with Hosa. I worry about the leg kicks, but overall, I think the activity of Aldana is going to be enough to win this one, and that's the thing. If you lose to Holly Holm and Amanda Nunes, I'm not going to completely write you off, because most fighters would lose to both of them. If you're 30 five year old who's seven and five in the UFC with a performance tonight over Lucia Pudzalova and you're coming off that lopsided title fight and you strike at a negative differential and you struggle with leg kicks Matt 
Give me the underdog Carol Hosa in the matchup. I think the smaller fighter is going to have that advantage. And when you look at somebody like Aldana, she's usually able to do well, even if she's getting pressured by circling away from the action, getting away from her opponent, cutting off that cage and landing some of those shots where she has that length advantage. She's got a height advantage in this fight, but as far as the reach, we'll see how she's able to play out half an inch or so for Aldana. I do like Hosa with a more varied game plan in this fight. So Matt, we are split on this one. I'm going with Carol Hosa. We'll see how the weight cut plays out for her because her last fight was up against the bantamweight but at featherweight so matt we are split on this one let us know who you have down below in the comment section some big time fights on this card the two title fights up at the top you're gonna want to keep it locked in with fighting apex we always say let's, let's get, get into, into it, it. On short notice, we welcome in the 10th ranked Bryce Mitchell Thug Nasty coming in on 10 days notice, replacing Giga Chikadze to take on Josh Emmett, the former interim title challenger. He took on Yair Rodriguez a couple of fights ago. It did not go his way in his last time out in a fight of the night against Ilya Tapuria. It also did not go his way. Matt, these two guys battling it out. They're looking to move one step closer at featherweight. And if you consider a fight like this, for Bryce Mitchell... He lost a lot of momentum a couple of fights ago. He's favored to go out there and do really well against Ilya Tapuria. But the first couple of power shots, they really did change the dynamic of that one. Tapuria ends up getting a giant win. And we'll all remember Bryce Mitchell's last time out carrying the good book out there. He gets the win over Dan Ige. And somewhat of a lackluster performance, but similar to Cody Garbrandt on this card beating Trevin Jones. A win's a win, and now you get this fight. So Matt, for Mitchell, he draws Emmett. For Emmett, he draws Mitchell. And there's a big thing to talk about in this fight. Josh Emmett goes from fighting a orthodox kickboxer in Giga Chikadze to fighting a southpaw grappler in Bryce Mitchell. So a giant switch up for him. Whereas for Mitchell, he's fought a lot of orthodox guys that throw power shots in the past. So if you do consider this fight, the other big talking point for Josh Emmett, his last three fights, one win two losses he's absorbed so much punishment just a lot of his career split decision went over calvin cater a lot of folks have thought the cater had won that fight but regardless emmett's the one going out there at the very end he's looking like he absorbed a lot of damage then he goes in and has that interim fight against yair rodriguez loses the fight by submission gets himself caught but if you look at his face at the end of the fight it's not all that good looking and then of course the loss that he had his last time out against Ilya Tapuria, more of the same. The catalyst could be that Jeremy Stevens fight back in 2018 to where he gets his eye socket completely mangled. And that was leading into this card, UFC 296 in the intro video. I talked to Josh Emmett right after that loss, so I threw that in as part of the intro package. But Matt, for Josh Emmett, doesn't absorb damage all that well. And for Bryce Mitchell, we've seen him dish it one time. One time against Edson Barboza, that short shot drops Barboza, initiates into his grappling. But Bryce Mitchell's a fighter. We've had a couple of them recently. Andrea Muniz last weekend, and then the weekend before that, Joe Selecki. These guys are premier grapplers that don't necessarily do things with a lot of their striking. He's kind of lumped into that category. The thing about Mitchell is, though, he does move well on the feet, I will say. He can get cornered up against the cage if you're a really aggressive fighter and you can defend those takedown attempts. But I wouldn't say he's as plodding as some of those other guys because he can move the feet well. His hand speed, I would say, is decent. I don't think he has wild pop in his hands by any means. I know he dropped Edson Barbosa. Cowboy Cerrone dropped Edson with a jab too once. So guess what? It's happened before. But for Mitchell, I do think his striking has progressed to where he doesn't just shoot in for not panic takedowns because he is such a good grappler. Like what else is he going to do? Not do the thing you're great at, but just not go in there and be so one dimensional. And I think the speed on the feet and the footwork is going to maybe give him an edge in this matchup because Josh Emmett was one of those original fighters like Howney Barcellos to where he got into the rankings like a little bit too late almost to where you're just worried about how much time he had left kind of being that great athlete he was and to Josh Emmett's credit he is a phenomenal athlete and his power is still pretty relevant to this day I know we didn't see a lot of it against Tapuria the last time out but he did land some good shots against Yair Rodriguez I know he ends up getting finished in that matchup but what led to some of those grappling exchanges near the end was he had Yair hurt with a big right hand he had him up against the cage like Josh Emmett wasn't just failing that fight and it wasn't just some one-sided beatdown so for Emmett I think there are things that you can build upon I just worry about the thing that you bring up and 
minutes has the damage just gotten so out of whack because Bryce Mitchell I know what we're going to focus on it's the submission ability if he is able to get on top of Josh Emmett which is a tough ass to do because Emmett is a very good defensive wrestler he's a great grappler though and if he's able to get on top of Emmett and really wear him out with some of those grappling exchanges could we see him use the ground and pound almost like his way of damaging Emmett with the strikes that we've seen from other guys well and Josh Emmett similar to other fighters on this card what's first martial art it's just like Cody Garbrandt it is the wrestling and he was Juco at Sacramento City and then he went NAIA at Menlo College but for Emmett you don't really see the offensive wrestling accentuated all that well but where you do see it is with some of the takedown defense and for Bryce Mitchell Per 15 minutes, he averages 3.51 takedowns at a 41% accuracy clip. And Bryce Mitchell, fourth all-time in featherweight history and control time with 52 minutes and 56 seconds. He's also second all-time in featherweight history for top position numbers at 47 minutes and 14 seconds. 47 minutes and 14 seconds, and the control time is 52 minutes. He's on top more than just holding guys up against the cage and plastering them there. When you look at it for Josh Emmett, number one all time, he's close there, in knockdowns. 11 knockdowns in featherweight history, and he's also third all time in knockdown average at 1.23. He's behind Jeremy Stevens and Conor McGregor in that respect. So Matt, for Josh Emmett, he packs a punch in with that power. Bryce Mitchell coming in on short notice taking this fight, and I mention it. Emmett's going from an orthodox stance kickboxer that he trained a camp for to then on 10 days notice, it's a, an opposite stance grappler. And Bryce Mitchell, like you said, he's a little speedy, a little unorthodox, likes to throw a head kick on the outside to close some of that distance. I think Bryce Mitchell's best win, even without getting a submission, no twister, no twister. But the times that he tried against Charles Rosa, oh, he had him bent. That was a what He had him bent. He was all bent. It, oh my goodness. He was in terrible positions in that fight. I did not envy and Charles Rosa in that match. For Josh fight. Emmett, I'd say his best this one's probably Shane Burgos. I mean, he had him six ways to Sunday in that one. So if we look at it, Mitchell is favored in the short notice fair. We have a look at the topology vote. Surprise to us there to you. If this fight happened in 2020 or 2021, I think they'd be a lot closer. But now we're here after those three fights with damage. I'm going to say over under 70% Mitchell. I think it'll be under. Slightly under. 702 total votes. 63% Mitchell. 68% by decision. For the 37% that have Emmett. 65% by knockout. Matt, I think Josh Emmett beats Bryce Mitchell in this fight. I also like the underdog in this matchup. Again, you can't throw up enough red flags for just how much damage Josh Emmett has taken. And not a very long span. Like, I guess his last fight was a little while ago now. But still, it's been a lot of damage. And at 38 years old, you worry, has he just kind of gone too far, right? Uh, to the point of no return. But Bryce Mitchell, when you look at his game, it's not the most damaging game. It's very controlling, like you had mentioned. It's very control-oriented. And if he goes out there and gets a submission win, I'm okay with that, right? Like, Bryce Mitchell could submit a horse if he wanted to. He's probably done weird stuff like that. But my point is, I think Emmett has good enough defensive striking. I think the power is going to make Bryce Mitchell uncomfortable enough on the feet to where it's not going to be as easy for him to get good takedown attempts in. Yeah, I, I just have a hard time going with a guy like Bryce Mitchell in this fight. Again, we know how good the grappling can be. I like the defensive wrestling out of Josh Emmett. Both of us going with Josh Emmett in the matchup, Matt. The next fight on this card... A good one. I mean, a great one. It starts off the main card of the pay-per-view portion. Vicente Luque take on old oh. teammate... Ian Machado, Gary, you're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fighting Apex, we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it. One of the big time fights on this UFC 296 card. This is a fight that your weird uncle Terry probably read, or read about on SureDog forums. We have the silent assassin Vicente Luque, a walking bonus machine. He's going to be taking on another guy in that same category. It's the future in Gary. And when it comes down to this fight, Matt, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of bad blood. There's a lot of vitriol on social media. And I'm sure we'll hear about it a little bit in the comments. But when you look at a guy like Ian Gary going from his native Ireland, to then down at Killcliffe, to mixing things up in his last camp at Shoot the Box, where he is still for this fight. Ian Gary's proved that having that judo pedigree in his back pocket to go along with the boxing can carry you a very long ways. And this guy, he became the Cage Warriors welterweight champ. He comes into the UFC... And not to say that they gave him a law, but they gave him fights that he would be able to kind of progress through and win. He fights Jordan Williams. A little bit of a tough test there. Gets hit by a couple of shots. Still gets a finish win. The Darian Weeks fight. The Gabe Green fight where he's able to knock him down to start out the third round. And then it's continued to snowball since then. His last two fights. You think of the Jeff Neal fight. You think of the fight against Neil Magny. He's been able to go out there. And while that 
Fight against Jeff Neal did not materialize. Machado Gary earns a big win with the head kick over Daniel Rodriguez in the interim. And his last time out against Neil Magny, he gets it done as well. So for Ian Gary, he's looked good in these recent string of fights. But the, what makes this one interesting is Gary having trained at Killcliffe. You see him palling around with guys like Vicente Luque to now having to fight Luque. There's going to be a lot of storylines. And I know Machado Gary... He's kind of gotten himself into an odd spot. There's a few fighters on this card that are in those same spot. He did an interview December 8th with TNT Sports. No, it wasn't with Charles Barkley. But it was one of those kind of documentaries where they follow him in his training camp. And Diego Lima himself, the main man at Shoot the Box, had nothing but good things to say about Ian Gary. The guy's a family man. His kid's always there at the gym. His wife's always around, so on and so forth. It's great to see. And he's really beloved by a lot of his teammates. What else are they going to talk about? No, this guy sucks. He's an awful teammate. No. What does that have every, to do with a fight, Luke? It has this to do with him. Ian Gary says in the interview or in the piece, I'm a little bit cautious about going to America. And then the next thing out, they say, or he says, me not being able to react to people in person. It's going to wind me up a little bit. I owe Free and Gary kind of all the talk and all the vitriol. It hasn't gotten to his head because you saw that last weekend in a main event. Song Yudong, Chris Gutierrez. In the middle of a fight, Chris Gutierrez is yelling at a fan to kind of butt out. Ian Gary could be in one of those spots where mentally maybe he's not in it to the point that he has been in certain other fights. And Vicente Luque, if he's anything, is durable like an old leather boot other than that Jeff Neal fight. And we saw Luque take a lot of time off, have the injuries that he had to withstand, go through the brain scans and so on. He goes out there his last time out. It was a statement performance against Dos Anjos. So, Matt, this is a big time fight for both these guys in this Walter Reed. It definitely is. But I'm a lot more worried about like the to Muay Thai of Vicente Luque or his jiu-jitsu than anybody on Twitter saying anything to Ian Gary. Because Vicente Luque is a massive step up. Ian Gary disabled the comments on his Instagram. Who knows where he's at? There's a lot of Craig, talk for this young man who's undefeated. Travis Scott did that about a Halloween costume once. Like, a lot of fighters get off social media when it comes to a fight. Vicente Luque's the toughest fight he's ever had, so I'm much more worried about Vicente Luque than the people on social media, that's all, because he's not fighting them in the cage. He's fighting Luque, who has absurd Muay Thai when he is firing on Altice, who is a dominant fighter when he's able to move forward, but that's been the thing about Luque that I'm really interested to see. Are we going to see him almost go into like a Michael Chiesa vibe because we've seen the wrestling more especially in that Dos Anjos matchup and we've always known how talented of a grappler he is once the fight hits the mat it just always has been the wrestling defense and the wrestling offense we haven't seen as much so I'm really interested to see if Luke goes out there and decides hey I am gonna focus a little bit more on my grappling because he's always been a fighter who can get the fight finished be it on the feet or on the mat and if the wrestling has opened up that much more it just helps him put more question marks in Ian Gary's mind because if Gary's able to sit on the back foot and really uh, time up some of his big power shots. I just don't know if Luke is going to be able to keep on marching in and closing that distance if Gary can keep on landing those straight shots. It will be an interesting fight. And if you look at it for Vicente Luque, he is ranked number nine coming into this fight. And he is also tied for eighth all time in UFC history with Frank Mir, Joe Lozon, Glover Teixeira with 13 finishes Top inside of the UFC. So pretty good spot there for Luke. And Machado Gary, it feels like, again, it was a slow burn on the way up. Again, it was much publicized, but it was a slow burn against certain opponents. To the last two being D-Rod, who's coming off an injury, and then Neil Magny. So Machado Gary, it kind of has felt like he's Kenny Chesney in 2005 a little bit. Because I'm living in fast forward. Hillbilly Rockstar, out of control. And now we got to rein it in. For this big time opportunity, another one on a pay-per-view main card where he is heavily favored to get the win. And we have a look over on Topology for the total fan vote on this one. I'm going to say over under 70% Gary. It's probably going to be over that. I, I'm going to say over. And it's over. So 1,317 total votes, 76% going with Gary, 54% by decision, 37% by knockout. For Luke, the 24% that have him, 33% by decision, 41% by knockout. So the fans, I mean, looking at maybe a knockout, looking at a finish in this fight. And again, for Gary, it's a lot of straight shots. We know he got his judo black belt at 18. We've seen decent takedown defense. The hallmark of Gary's kind of career up into going into the UFC had really good ground and pound. Had really good takedowns. We haven't necessarily seen as much of that in the UFC. We've seen him kind of withstand and overcome. I talked about the Jordan Williams performance. Song Kanan dropped him, and then he finished him in the third round. 
Gary has shown a bit of a progression with the skills, so I'm eager to see what we get out of him at a shoot-the-box camp. And with Luke A not training in Brazil for this one, he's training at Killcliffe. Are we going to see more of that wrestling from him in this fight? I think the striking's going to be enough. Because the thing about Vicente Luque is, for as high as the highs have been, he also has been rocked in every single fight the man has ever had, even on his win streak. Like, we could talk about the blips on the radar that Ian Geary has had. Vicente Luque was losing to Brian Barbarena, like, pretty handily until he wasn't. He was getting beat by Nico Price in multiple fights until he finished Nico Price. Luque is one of these fighters who has had to fight his way back into a lot of these matchups. And with the grappling advantage that he does have, because... This is what I agree with you 100% on. Gary has had a kind of a unique run up the division in a good way to build a prospect because he's faced all these different challenges. D-Rod, a guy with good boxing, good power, but he might not have a, the most total skill set of all time. Then you go to Neil Magny, super well-rounded, has great cardio, but he might not have the highest propensity to go out there and get finishes. Well, Luke is kind of that combination of the two. He can go out there and get submissions. He can get knockout wins, but I just think the defensive striking aspect of Luke is still there as an issue. And for that reason, I think Gary's going to be able to capitalize. Gary's last time out, it might surprise some people. Two 30-26s and a 30-24. He went 43 of 43 on leg, it's leg kick attempts. And I, maybe that's something that they've added a little bit more out there with Diego Lima because you saw it earlier on from Machado Gary. He threw a leg kick. He hit almost near his ankle. It would slap the leg and it wasn't all that damaging. His last time out, it did slow some of the movement of Neil Magny and it made it really difficult for him as that fight went on. I do like Gary... He throws a lot of straight shots out there and he mixes up some of his power and Luke a tends to lead with his head, lead with a lot of that guard, withstand a lot of that damage or take it, withstand it, struggle with it against Jeff Neal. So Matt, for both of us going with Ian Gary out of Ireland, spoke in that interview with TNT a little bit about getting the opportunity to train for the first time with Conor McGregor over in Ireland. We'll see how that plays out too. So listen. Can't wait to hear from you down below in the comment section on this fight, Matt. We get some big time ones on this card. Tony Ferguson's taking on Patty Pimblett. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it. It's a weird fight on the main card of UFC 296. Lightweight former interim champ Tony Ferguson. He's been kind of like the king's guard between 10 and 11 in the UK. Change into the guard in just about every single fight. He's on a six-fight losing streak. And if he loses this one, Matt, Tony Ferguson's going to tie an all-time UFC record with BJ Penn in a bad way. He's going to be taking on the body, Patty Pimblett. Patty Pimblett coming off of a bad leg injury. You can see it over there on his YouTube channel. He documents it, but earlier on this year, getting surgery, knee Ligament issues, ankle, he was wearing a walking boot, but regardless, for Patty Pimblett, looking to continue to win. And that was the big thing. For Pimblett, you knew how good he was coming into the UFC. A former Cage Warriors featherweight champ. He challenged for the vacant lightweight belt against Soren Bach. He got a little bit out-wrestled in that one. Had to pick things back up. Wins over Decky Dalton, David Martinez, and so on. He ends up in the UFC. And you remember the big wins. He's getting outstruck by Luigi Vendramini. Finds himself back in that fight. He gets the win. He gets things done. He then strings off some more finish wins. Kazula Vargas, Jordan Levitt. And then his last time out, the judges gave him a win over Jared Gordon. So Matt, for Patty Pimblett, he's got to get things going. And now he gets an opportunity against a recognizable name, who has been sputtering of late. But Tony Ferguson, not for nothing, going with David Goggins. And there was that uh, Cam Haynes podcast out there, JRE, where Joe Rogan's talking about it. Tony Ferguson, he's the only person that's been able to go through Hell Week with David Goggins. I don't know personally much about David Goggins other than the fact that, like, what was he, a Marine at one point? But I'll tell you what I do know, Matt. I said I had a book that I was going to pull out. I don't know anything about David Goggins. But I have been reading The Optimist, A Case for Fly Fishing Life, by David Coggins. And I I'm, just look at it this way. It's like if he trained with LeBron and got through... Like, what does he have to do with MMA? I thought he was... Conditioning a, and cardio. Now, the only thing that it doesn't make sense is that Tony Ferguson has had good conditioning and exactly. cardio in five-round fights... And this is a three-round fight. I don't know what benefit that is to this. This is the way I look at Tony Ferguson, and I could be completely off. But for the longest time, he was such a great fighter with his well-roundedness, with his aggressiveness, because he's as good of a striker as he's a grappler. He has good offensive wrestling. The defensive wrestling has always been a little suspect. But when you're as good of a grappler as Tony Ferguson, you don't really need to worry about the defensive wrestling. But he would play his opponent's game with them until they made a mistake, and then he would switch it up on them. That's when he'd throw the change up. They'd be out swinging, and he just fooled them. That's when he'd be able to make Anthony Pettis look foolish. 
foolish, right? Get him into a brawl after eating some really big shots. Wrestle with a guy like Kevin Lee and then wrestle him into exhaustion and take advantage of it. We still do see some of those shades of Tony Ferguson to where he's playing his opponent's game, but I just don't know if he has those athletic abilities at this stage of his career at 39. And he's not even a 39, right? Like he's been around MMA for a long time. He's had some pretty serious injuries. A lot of people are going to remember the knee injury that he tripped over the court at ESPN and that ruined the Khabib fight. But Ferguson has just reached the stage of his career to where I don't know if you can reshape him and just make him something different after all these fights. No, I, I have no idea the cardio conditioning thing with David Goggins, what the point of it was. But if you look at a guy like Tony Ferguson, unorthodox on the feet, a lot of spins with the elbows up and to the side. Like, he really does embody the name of his gym and all those weird things that he writes on social media. Hashtag Snapdown City. But he is such an oddball fighter and a hard guy to train for, you would assume. And for Patty Pimblett out of Next Generation Liverpool, I'll be eager to see what we get out of him. Because we all remember him for the flying uh, submission that he had over with cage wars remember him as the champ we remember him for getting fights down to the ground and then working tko then working submissions but for patty pimblett on the feet i remember that fight against venjamini where rogan cormier hey this guy the head movement leaving his head out there on the center line not really moving and his hands are pretty low his fight against jared gordon it was a little bit the same so we'll see if that's reworked a little bit because when i first saw this fight booked you think about throwing the retweet with a comment. This It's like Guram Tataladze, Elvis Brenner. Why are we doing any of this? But then when you actually dig into the, the kind of meat of the bone of the fight, there are parallels and there are ways for even Tony Ferguson on a terrible losing streak to get a win. I, why are we here? It's called putting people over. Uh, oh, yeah. That's what it is. Like, no MMA fighter has ever had an easy send-off, ever. Because you want to build up the next generation off of the notoriety that fighter has had. Remember when Ihor Pateria fought Shogun Hua and it made no sense at all and he knocked him out and it was a terrible fight and nobody felt good about it? Like, this fight is what the UFC is trying to do. Now, maybe Tony Ferguson does have enough left in the tank to where he can take advantage of the defensive lapses of Paddy Pimblett, like you said. The chin is very high up in the air. I know supposedly Scousers don't get knocked out, but Darren Till has proven that uh, to not be true whatsoever. But Pimblett's wrestling, I think, is going to be his key to this victory because that's the thing that Tony Tony Ferguson, or at least the issue that we've seen really get accentuated on this losing streak. Benil held him down. Charles Oliveira held him down. And I know these are really good fighters. Don't get me wrong. But Paddy Pimblett, I think, has the game to where if he holds Tony Ferguson down, he can get the win that way. Paddy Pimblett, a pretty darn big favorite. We have a look over on Topology at the fan vote. I'm going to say over under 82.5% Pimblett. I think it's going to be under because Tony's so popular. And it is under 1,344 total votes, 63% going Pimblet, 47% by submission for the 37% that have Ferguson, 37% by decision, 44% by knockout. For Tony Ferguson, the last two fights, Nate Diaz submits him. He looked a touch slow on the feet and couldn't really figure out the range. And against Bobby Green, there were some moments, but by and large, Bobby Green was able to withstand. He was able to get that submission win too. I'll go with Patty Pimblet, but I I don't feel good about it. And I have picked Ferguson in some of these losses to the fact where people are going, why are you picking Tony Ferguson? So I'll go with Pimblet in this one, but it's a it's a tricky one. I like the tapology votes and how they're split. Like, I have Pimblet, but, like, I'm about six to four, if you will. Because if Tony Ferguson's able to go out there and make Pimblet so uncomfortable on the feet, because Ferguson is at his best when he's throwing those elbows, being a damaging striker. We all remember that uh, post that went viral, and it's like, these are all the fighters after they fought Tony Ferguson. And they are very damaged after the fact. If Tony can land some of those elbows, land those uppercuts, the jab, the front kick, and make Pimblet really feel those strikes, I think he can have success. I just don't know if the grappling defense is going going to be there and if Pimblet does decide hey I'm gonna go try to grapple with Tony Ferguson I never thought I'd say these words because of who Tony Ferguson was at one point but I think Pimblet can have success in the mat against him both of us going with Patty the Batty to get the win Matt we'll see a bar stools in attendance in Vegas because they've been on that train and I don't know where they've been since but when it comes down to this matchup we're going with England's own to get it done Matt the next fight on the card it's another one of those ones. Uh, Shavkat Rachmanov taking on Wonderboy Thompson. A big time fight at welterweight. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Another possible passing of the torch matchup. UFC 296. Hopefully, Jack Black and Kyle Gass can walk out Steven Wonderboy Thompson. Because back not that long ago, UFC 291, when he was supposed to take on Michelle Pereira, who showed up at Juicy 174 LBs, and they didn't let that fight continue, or Wonderboy didn't accept it. 
yeah, Jack Black wasn't going to be able to make the walk. So we look forward to that. Thompson looking to move it forward. He's going to be taking on Shavkat Rachmanov. He's undefeated. All 17 wins by finish. The former M1 Global welterweight champ. And Matt, when you look at this fight, the wild thing about it is obviously the age gap. Wonder Boy in February turns 41. He kicked off his pro kickboxing career in 2004. Matt, in 2004, a movie that I have on Universal Media Disc was filmed that movie the wedding crashers matt do you think many P people have psp discs like i have in my hand that was the first movie that i might have rewound to look at the the boob sequence on the on i the hate vince vaughn so fun fact about me i can't stand vince vaughn in anything he's in what about owen wilson true did i like oh wow. wow owen wilson's good but vince vaughn just ruins everything for me because i just look at him as vince vaughn and when you're trying to watch true detective and vince vaughn walks onto the screen it takes you out of the show a little bit but back to the fight what about vince vaughn and swingers people like him in that movie i just don't like vince vaughn very all much. right what about four christmases but when it comes down to this matchup Matt, for rachmanov master of sport and combat sambo master of sport in mma they're about the same but when you look at it for rachmanov being undefeated continuing to win out i talked about it last weekend you go back and you watch Shavkat fight in the Rage with M1. And he's fighting Jun Young Park. He gets taken down early in that fight. He ends up getting an armbar submission win. He tries it round one. He gets it round two. You look at the way the striking has continued to evolve. And the the only negative that we had for Akmanov coming into the UFC, sometimes he'd live, leave his chin up. Sometimes he'd get taken down. But he continues to win these fights. For Shavkat, the Jeff Neal fight was wild. That's a really good one on the rewatch. And for Thompson, I talk about him starting in pro kickboxing in 2004. He comes into the UFC, beats Dan Stitgen. He gets a bonus there. He goes on a wild win streak at a point. He gets the fight against Woodley. First one, listen, was it close? It was. Yeah, it was, it was close. Draw. It ends up as a draw. The second one ends up as a majority decision win for uh, Wood. Yeah, it was Woodley. But where Thompson's kind of re-emerged and re-evolved since that fight against one Tyron Woodley, things have kind of gone not that great. He's been four and four. You think of him getting put on a poster by uh, one Anthony Pettis. You also think about Thompson's last time out last December. It was in Orlando. A hot, muggy spot. And he gets a wild win over Kevin Holland. So, Wonder Boy, he's that guy that you got to beat to get to the top. And we'll see if Rachmanov can do that here. Every time I think Steven Thompson has nothing left in the tank, he's like, no, 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 no. Miles left to go. We don't got to worry about it. And it is really insane to see because normally there is a very clear drop off for a lot of athletes, especially in MMA, right? The chin goes, we just got done talking about Tony Ferguson. He's lost six fights in a row. So it's very apparent what happens to a lot of these aging stars. But for Wonder Boy, he is able to kind of reverse the clock every now and then because his reflexes are still pretty good for a guy who's 40 years old. And that's always been the thing about Wonder Boy. He's not a striker in a traditional sense whatsoever even at this stage of his career he's he's really unique into where he likes throwing the front kick with the right leg when he's uh southpaw he'll throw a lot more leg kicks when he's uh orthodox just because he likes that right leg a little bit more all those things are going to be interesting to see if they work against a guy like Shavkat Rachmanov because Rachmanov will match him a lot with that striking but what does he also have in the back pocket if he really needs to utilize it? He can go for the takedowns and not only takedowns from open space where the footwork of Thompson I think helps him evade some of those. Rachmanov I think is going to use the clinch to then set up his takedowns and if he uses the clinch to at least get Wonderboy close to him I think it's just going to allow the takedowns to be that much easier. Now to Wonderboy's credit even in the Gilbert Burns fight that he lost it's a loss on paper but it's not a loss that you look at and think, wow, Wonder Boy shot, right? He gets held up against the cage for a lot of it. He gets held down, but I wouldn't say he gets outmaneuvered in a lot of it. It's a pretty bad fight, if you guys want the honest truth. But I thought Wonder Boy did a decent job, all things considered, defensively in that fight. Now, the Muhammad fight, he struggled with some of those takedowns, but I just don't know if Rachmanov's going to be as dedicated to the wrestling attack. Well, I do. Uh, when you look at this one, Rachmanov at a Kill Cliff FC, you look at his last fight. A standing rear naked choke win. The only fight that I could think of where somebody got a standing rear naked choke. Matt, do you have an example? Uh, yeah, Charles Oliveira versus Will Brooks. He gets on his back and he gets him. But That's I a thought... standing rear naked choke, though. They're standing. Yeah, if you're standing. But I mean, like, both guys are standing. Oh, Jan Blahovich, Devin Jan Clark. Jan Blahovich, Devin Clark was the only one that I could think of. So there are standing rear naked choke victories. But Jan Blahovich against Devin Clark, it's very similar. Rachmanov against Jeff Neal, it's no moss. And they're both standing. It was absolutely wild. But I look at those Wonder Boy losses where he's up against Gilbert Burns, uh, a guy who trains with Shavkat, and then against Bilal Muhammad, who's going to serve as the alternate for this weekend's title fight. 
to where, yeah, Rachmanov could have a lot of success with his grappling. And we obviously saw the striking for Rachmanov against Carlson Harris, the spinning wheel kick. That was wild. But, Matt, for me, I do like Rachmanov in the fight. He's a pretty big favorite. Topology votes, we won't leave him wow. as a secret. 1,378 of them. 90% Rachmanov, 60% by submission for the 10% that have Wonderboy, 54% by decision. But I just think... Rachmanov has a decided advantage in the grappling. I, I think he'll get it done with that. I also think he has a big advantage in the grappling, and that's why I have him in the matchup. But I still worry about him closing the distance initially because Wonderboy does a great job of keeping his back off the cage. Yes, the fighters who have been able to get him in that spot have had success, but for the most part, he does a great job of circling his back off the cage. The Rory McDonald one, if you really want to go back a ways before he fought Tyron Woodley, another good example of it. So I, I think Wonderboy can be tricky, especially in the early goings. But Rachmanov isn't a one tune fighter by any means and I think he's going to use that advantage. And Rachmanov has a little bit of that prime till to where I'm here and I'm not. And he does that a little bit well. Or he does a little bit well. He does it very well as he's trying to close the distance. So Matt, both of us going with Kazakhstan's Shavkat Rachmanov to get the win in the matchup. And that sets us up very, very well for the big time fights up at the top, Matt. Two title fights. Pantoja Royval in the rematch and in the main event, Leon Edwards taking on Colby Covington. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight and Apex. We always say, let's, let's get it into it. It is time for the co-main event of UFC 296. It is a big time banger at flyweight. It is a rematch going back just a couple of years. Alessandro Pantoja in the first title defense. He gets to take on Raw Dog. Ooh, baby, I like it raw. Brandon Roy Vol. When it comes down to this fight, this is the first UFC flyweight title fight to not have some combination or one of the other of Devison Figueredo and Brandon Royval going back to January 19th, 2019. Brandon Moreno. Yes, Brandon Moreno, not Brandon Royval. But the first time since January 19th, 2019, that was the first ESPN card, Henry Cejudo taking on TJ Dillashaw. After that, it's been all some combination of Figueredo and Moreno, and it was announced by Big Marcel. On a suspicion, but Brandon Moreno going to be serving as an alternate to this title fight. So, Matt, for Alessandre Pantoja, four fight win streak. His last time out there, he gets the win over Brandon Moreno. A split decision. He drops him really early on in that fight. A close competitive fight. And you look at it for Royval, a string of three wins in a row. His last time out, a performance bonus, a first round finish over Natesh Nikolaou. And if you consider it, I mean, Pantoja, little bit of five-round magic. He had that string with RFA where he was the champ to get him into the Ultimate Fighter Season 24 Tournament of Champions. Tim Elliott fights Demetrius Johnson in the end. But Pantoja, that was his first title fight, or first five-round fight, rather, was against Brandon Moreno in a meaningful amount of time. For Brandon Royval, he had a couple of title fights with the LFA, being five rounds, one against Casey Kenny, and then, of course, one where he ends up winning the belt. But Brandon Royval, a little bit of five-round experience, though it's been a while. If you go back and you watch the first fight that these two guys had listen pantoja has some success with the wrestling he ends up getting the finish with it brandon royval does a little bit with the striking too and he tries to threaten with the leg locks as well it might not be a giant competitive fight but brandon royval halfway through that first round looked like he was going to get the win because of pantoja he was kind of looking like he was getting tired until he started throwing out one-twos. But isn't that the weird thing about Royval, right? Like, in the wins and losses, you can nitpick some negatives in there. Like, he can get hurt by weird shots. And that's the thing about Royval, and that's the thing about both these fighters. I think we are going to see a bit of a hot potato with the belt at flyweight right now, because the top five seem so well-matched with each other. It does feel like anyone could beat anyone on any given night, and that's why I'm probably most excited for this matchup this weekend, because I just think stylistically, this is the most fight night main event kind of title fight you can get. And I might say that and it might sound disrespectful but i just mean that in terms of neither one of these guys fights safe right and how many title fights do we look at and we think hey this fighter was exciting but then they won the belt and they decided i like keeping this belt around my waist i don't think pantoja or royval is going to go in there and have a really long uh feeling out process or heat up process but i am going to look for can royval make pantoja uncomfortable with his striking because a lot of what makes royval so unique on the feet is he can throw elbows from weird angles the spinning elbow that dropped kai kara france one of my all-time great or favorite non-knockout strikes but he can get weird 
weird with it. And if Pantoja can do a good job defensively, he does do a decent job keeping his hands up. But like you mentioned, they can drop when he gets a little bit overconfident. And the fight I always go back to and look at is the Devison Figueredo matchup. That Figueredo fight was great between him and Pantoja, and I could watch those guys fight 10 times. But when Pantoja would really start to feel himself and move forward, that's when he'd walk into a really big counter shot. And I worry that his confidence might almost be the biggest downfall for him in a matchup like this. And again, you see good pressure from Pantoja in the first fight against Roy Vall. You see the takedown. You end up seeing the win for Pantoja. Sets himself up really well. If you look at it for Pantoja, you don't have to go very far away from that Alex Perez win that he did have. I mean, you look at the loss against Oscar Askarov and he struggles in a little bit of the grappling. But for Pantoja to go out there and get these marquee wins, to go out there against Alex Perez... Just as soon as it started, it was over. Like, was it was insane. pretty wild. And you saw that from the opening clip for this UFC 296 intro at the start of this card. But Pantoja's last time out, again, a very close fight against Brandon Moreno. Drops him early, and then it kind of goes from there. For Brandon Royval, you got to watch out for those lead knees. You saw that against Mateusz Nikolaou. But you see it in a lot of his fights. The spinning shots, the takedown defense not being all that spectacular. It's at a 39% takedown defense clip for Brandon Royval in the UFC. But we've seen fighters like Bon Turin and like Pantoja really work their takedowns and find success against them. Now, he's one of those guys, he doesn't play by that Luis Smolka effect. He tries, to, after he tries to zip out of some of these bad shots. We've seen Brandon Royval fight the likes of Tim Elliott succeed in some of those exchanges. That was, what, the debut, debut that he yeah. had in the UFC. You see it against Kai Kara France in a wild fight. But Matt, I'm eager to see, again, for Brandon Royval. I thought he was going to flick some of those more basic things out there when it looked like Pantoja was tired in the first round of their fight, but he doesn't normally fight like that. So we'll see if what Royval brings into the cage for this one. A few fighters from Factory X on this card. He is one of them. And for Pantoja at ATT, some of the best to train with oh, in the world sure. at that gym. So when you look at this one, Pantoja, a slight favorite in the rematch, pretty well the same spot that he was in their first fight. He was favored. We have a look at the topology votes, Matt. Surprise to us, Sarah, to you. I'll let you set this one. I think they're going to be at 80% Pantoja, and I know that seems high based on the odds, but just the fact that you've won their first fight by stoppage. I'm going to say under. We have a look at it, and it is over. 1,339 total votes, 89% Pantoja, 61% by submission for the 11% that have Royval, 53% by knockout. So submission for Pantoja, knockout for Royval. Who do you have in this one? Pantoja might be able to work his way to a submission. I don't discredit that. We've seen it once before. I have no reason to believe he can't do it again. But I do think his striking is going to be more at the forefront in this matchup because if he gets on the inside, he can make Brandon Royval feel really uncomfortable if Royval's not able to land some of those up-the-middle attacks. So for as dangerous of an opponent as Royval is, because you just never feel safe with him anytime you're in the cage because he has such an ability to get finishes on the feet or on the mat, I just ever so slightly favor Pantoja. But like I said at the start, I think Fly is one of those divisions right now where the top six is in a pretty healthy spot and anybody could beat anyone and that's what makes the division so much fun. Brandon Royval likes to get it mixed in tight and dirty with a lot of those shots. You see it with his elbows, with his dirty boxing, everything that Brandon Royval can do. He can do well from space. He throws a lot of kicks. He can flick that jab out there really well from Southpaw, but he likes to get in tight and make it kind of nasty, just like a Tony Ferguson type in his prime. For Alessandro Pantoja, though, he can do things really well from distance, and I really did like that one-two that he had in their first pairing. I do like the wrestling for him in certain matchups, but if we get the Pantoja that we get against Moreno... Brandon Royval being so squirrely on the ground, it could actually make it difficult for Pantoja. I will go with Pantoja in the rematch in this one, but Matt, this is a big time interesting fight and you see it in the main event as well. Leon Edwards loses the first fight against Kamaru Usman. He's losing the first fight until he ends up winning it and then in the third shot, he gets the win in the trilogy. Pantoja going out there against Brandon Moreno Three big wins out there. Now he gets another Brandon in a rematch. A big time fight. Really like to hear your thoughts with who you folks have to win in this matchup. In all the others and in the main event that's on the way. Oof. You're going to want to keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. We get to end the year and end the things with Fight Night Picks. UFC 296, the main event, welterweight title fight. Leon Rocky Edwards, a second straight title defense. He ends up capping the trilogy with Kamaru Usman. Sends him up to middleweight after that. But a big win for Edwards his last time out. And now he gets to move forward and take on Colby Covington. His first action, Covington, since UFC 272 in a non-title main event fight of the night. 
I can see retiring Jorge Masvidal. So I'm at 651 days between fights for Covington. And listen, I mean, he really is the question mark in this equation. We really don't know what we're going to get out of Covington. We know how good the wrestling is. We know how good the striking has been or has progressed. He's never gets And Covington's one of those guys from American Top Team to MMA Masters. He just continued to kind of carve out his own path in this division. And the weirdest part about it, when you look at a guy like Colby Covington, you know how good certain things can be. You know how he can struggle in certain spots. We saw that against Kamaru Usman in their two fights. Usman striking just a little bit too much. But that's the wildest thing for a guy like Covington. His knockdown ratio in the UFC is 1-4 to four against all four of those in two fights with Usman. The one guy that Covington was able to truly knock down in the UFC, fellow Canadian Jonathan Mounier. So it's been a little bit of time for Covington. But again, very special fighters in this fight. Wrestling of Covington, the college uh, background that he has. And for Leon Edwards, Team Renegade, who had it made. I mean, uh, listen, I don't know if he likes sticks, but I do know that you're going to work a lot of that grappling with that gym. But Edwards, where it gets done... That lead head kick, that boxing, the combinations, the body work that he's able to do with the leg kicks as well. Edwards is a very special fighter. We know that from both these guys by now. Oh, by sh for sure. And it is a weird fight because for Leon Edwards, it's been a slow burn to get to the title. And now there's still quite a bit of work to do, even though it's been a while. Like, he was in that weird limbo that Kamar Usman himself was in, right? Nobody wanted to fight Usman. He was a difficult fight. He probably wasn't going to get a lot of fans there because he might not have the most exciting style. But he kept on beating everybody. And at a certain point, they had to give him a title shot and to Leon Edwards credit like you said it's not how you start the fight it's how you end the fight and it may not have started well it did start out pretty good against Usman he had mount on him he took him down but rounds two three and four were not going his way whatsoever and I'm not big on like the cheesy Rocky speeches in the corner but my goodness Leon Edwards got one of the all-time great ones and he went out there and executed to perfection and it was nice to see him put on a more complete performance in the rematch right it wasn't like it just came down to a Hail Mary but the rematch wasn't a phenomenal fight I will say that like it was a pretty close fight. A lot of those rounds were closely contested. And I think that can be uh, chopped up in two different things. A, Leon probably made some big improvements from going to not winning a lot of those rounds to winning the majority of the rounds and winning the decisions. And B... I think those Usman fights get you ready for somebody like Covington to where you bring it up. Is that time on the shelf? Yes, it's going to help Covington's chin. You know, we have seen him be cracked. He doesn't have a bad chin by any means. That's not what I'm saying. Covington's very durable. But with the Edwards fighting guys who are primary wrestlers, have really good cardio, and will force you to strike on the feet, is fighting someone like Usman just the best thing you can do to get ready for Covington? Same thing, like fighting Covington is the best thing you can do to get ready for Usman. It worries me a little bit, especially off of Leon Edwards' last fight. So UFC 278... He's hanging out with the folks in Salt Lake City and winning his belt. His last time out, UFC 286, folks might look at it and, okay, it's a decision win for Leon Edwards. And then it's a majority decision win for Leon Edwards. Why is it a majority decision for Leon Edwards? Because he grabbed the fence in the third round and lost a point. Like, that is kind of a scary proposition if you really like Leon Edwards in this fight, facing a guy who's a primary wrestler in Colby Covington. If he's going out there and accepting takedowns, if he's grabbing the fence, those are poor things to look at. If you look at the overall decision, I thought, you know, round one, round two, round five for Edwards, maybe even a case for round four for Leon Edwards. Like, he did go out there and do a good job, but wrestling was still a big part of the equation for Ed, uh, for Usman, and that's how Usman had won their first fight between them way back on the fight night scene. Do you think Covington can stand up to some of the power of Edwards, though? Because Covington's a unique fighter in terms of his striking's got better, but it's still weaponized by his cardio. Like, everything comes from the fact that Colby Covington doesn't get tired. If fights were 15 rounds, him, Brandon Moreno, and Nate Diaz would have flawless records, because cardio has never really been an issue for Covington, and he's someone who can fight at a high pace and maintain that high pace, but I worry that he's going to just keep himself in poor positions for Edwards to counter, because you could throw great volume, but if you're not really damaging Leon Edwards, and if you're not tiring him out with the wrestling, you are just standing in the pocket and allowing him to leave some of those windows open that Edwards can definitely counter with, but Edwards is a weird fighter for this respect. He fights to the level of his competition, but he's really good at it, which is the weird thing. Like, rarely you can say that about someone in the title picture. Remember when he fought Peter Sabata, and it was like, he beat him, don't get me wrong, but it was kind of close until he finished him at the end. He beat Gunnar Nelson, and that was, that a, was dumb, a good one. Yeah, that, it's, it's a split decision. It's not a split decision. He beat him pretty soundly. But a lot of those positions, like, he'd be in mount, he'd be dominant, he'd have him hurt in the ground. They just wouldn't do a lot with them. We need to see that uptick in aggression from Leon Edwards if he and, wants to win this, just because Covington does so much. And I think we had seen it from Edwards in the buildup. You saw the fight against Dos Anjos where he's able to nullify the grappling, utilize it a little bit to his 
advantage. The fight against Bilal Muhammad, it was unfortunate with the eye poke. But, but, unfortunate due to the eye poke, Matt, we taped these videos on Sunday. Sunday night, MMA junkie Farah Hanoon, she releases an interview with Bilal Muhammad, who is the alternate to this title fight. So really interesting news about a week out that you get to hear about that. When you look at these two guys again, with Leon Edwards, crisp striking, mixes in his power shots, trains with a really great team for Covington, MMA Masters. And again, if you want to put him in terms of the all-time pantheon of UFC greats, 10th all-time in UFC history with 67 takedowns landed. And he's ninth all-time in control time in UFC history. And for Covington, you look at the losses. There's three of them. Usman Usman, and Matt, that old guillotine oh by Worley Alvis. So kind of wild there. So we have a look at this one, Matt. And we always do this. I mean, Leon Edwards, slight favorite in the matchup. It's been a long boat of inactivity for Colby Covington. We throw it out to you folks. YouTube community tab. You guys have shown up for this one. And I will refresh wow. it. But Matt, I mean, listen. About 1,000 votes on this one so far. 1,200 to be exact. 54% with Leon Edwards. So it's really close. We got a brick of text from Chandler Witt, who's out there every week. Uh, Isaiah is saying, hype for the FNP finale. Good luck in the future, boys. Much Thank appreciated. Uh, Anthony is saying, or sorry, Andy is saying he's going to completely pick Colby apart and knock him out. Nate Jackson saying, I pick Leon, but so badly want it to be Colby. And YP saying, I want Leon to win. I want to see Bilal rematch, but I think Colby takes it. I like that comment. You know, I want to see that rematch yeah. with Bilal Muhammad too. Uh, so from that respect, I have to take Leon Edwards, right? Maybe you get a fight outside of the title picture. But it's a weird one. I mean, Covington, we didn't even say it, was an interim champ at one point. And then they took the belt because of the old deviated septum uh, surgery. So wild stuff there for Covington. Then he doesn't end up fighting Woodley. Darren Till gets the fight. It's just wildness. So Matt... For you in this fight, who's the pick? I have Leon Edwards. I think Colby Covington has the skill set to win this fight, don't get me wrong. But with the time off, it's hard to just jump back in the title picture. It's the one good thing about boxing. You can get a warm-up fight, and people might not like them, right? But it's pretty good to go in there, test your skill set, and see how you feel at that level before jumping into the title picture. And for Leon Edwards, listen, can you can you knock the lack of aggression sometimes? Yeah, he might not be the perfect fighter, but he's a pretty darn skilled one. And his skill set is one that doesn't feature a ton of massive weaknesses. And I do think that's Leon Edwards' biggest strength. Like, yes, he's a great Muay Thai striker. He has great head kicks and whatnot. But there's not just that one glaring hole in his game that you could point to and be like, hey, it's pay and Pritchard were going after him. Yeah, I mean, Leon Edwards has been in the UFC for a really long time. Uh, he's got 69% takedown defense, and he, in fights that he's had where there's been more two or more takedowns, that's happened in seven of his 16 UFC fights. So he has given up a fair amount of takedowns in his fights. He's the champion. It's not like they're losing him fights, is my point. Like, if you give up some takedowns, who cares if you can beat everybody? Like, Leon Edwards, there's no massive hole. Like, yes, the takedown defense isn't a 10 out of 10, but it's not like it's so bad. Like, 70%, we're not not. No, and, and we've seen Colby Covington beat primary strikers with his wrestling. Obviously, Jorge Masvidal was the latest example, but if you go back to Covington, he had less than a handful of fights, and he beat the... How does it work with Bellator? Do I say current Bellator welterweight champ? Or is it the Bellator Soon PFL? To be PFL I, well, no, Jason I Jackson. He beat uh, the ass-kicking machine, Jason Jackson. And you know how good that can be for Covington. I don't know. The inactivity, it really is tough. And I do like Leon Edwards in this fight. I think as far as activity when it comes to the strikes and what he's able to offer up as a variety, I think it'll be able to get it done for him. But this is a really intriguing fight. Sure. And I know we're going to get a lot of different kind of thoughts and, and varying degrees of separation between these two in the comment section. So let us know who you have. Matt, UFC 296, the last show from FNP here. I'm going to go back. I'm going to live life. I'm going to work my job, and I'm going to live life. And we're going to look forward to doing some other stuff. And listen, you call it an indefinite hiatus because you never want to say retirement. We could come back in the future. But there's a lot of stuff going on. Like I've always said, the best part of this has been interacting with you guys. Y'all have been a really fun bunch to talk MMA with the past few years. So yeah, it's always made these Saturdays for Fight Nights a lot more exciting knowing that we talk to you guys. So tune in for Question Mark Kicks two hours before the prelims here on Saturday. Make sure you check that out. You can always find us X and Instagram at Craig Allen FNP at Matt Allen FNP. Hopefully you guys really do enjoy the fights that are coming up this week. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it.